to start our meeting. It is six o'clock. Roll has been taken, and we have um, a full board here tonight. First item up is I need a motion for approval of the agenda as presented. I move. Second. Oh, West moved, Van seconded. Call the question. Motion passes. Next up is the reading of the school district mission statement. Kelly, would you be able to read that for us tonight? The Brookings School District prepares all learners to be confident, engaged citizens, empowered to impact the ever-changing and interconnected world. Thank you, Kelly. This time, um, this is a time for board members and administration to identify any items on the agenda that could be considered a conflict of interest. Do we have any waivers to present? We do not have any this evening. Next up is, um, thank you. 5.1, this is an opportunity for members of the audience to address the board concerning issues that are not on the agenda. Per policy, KD, a presentation should be as brief as possible. Um, our policy speaks to five minutes unless an extension of time is granted. And also, just quickly to note that um, whenever information is presented during the community section, we aren't able to actually act on it in the same meeting, um, but we welcome all of the community feedback that we can get. All right, first up, um, Natalie. She's going to be speaking on the COVID prevention. Go ahead and come up to the table. And you're going to be wanting to press the button so that you see a green light. And it needs to be pretty close to your mouth. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Maybe a little closer. Can you hear? Uh, testing. One, two, three. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I'm Dr. Natalie Takes. Um, I have a background in epidemiology. I have a master's degree in public health. And... Um, I earlier today sent the CDC guidelines um, and the American Association Pediatric Guidelines to school board members. And I just wanted to come tonight to read a few of the points from those out loud um, as it pertains to back to school plans um, that the school would take in order to limit or reduce COVID-19 transmission in the school. So um, the one thing to note is that the guidelines have just changed on August 5th. And um, I'll just read what's written here. Given new evidence on the Delta variant, CDC has updated the guidance for fully vaccinated people. CDC recommends universal indoor masking for all teachers, staff, students, and visitors to K-12 schools, regardless of vaccination status. Children should return to full-time in-person learning in the fall with layered prevention strategies in place. So um, if you've clicked on that link, you can see that there are key takeaways bulleted on the CDC. Um, and there are a lot of the same things that we were doing last fall. And I think the school district did an excellent job of keeping our kids in school and keeping viral transmission low. And we just need to keep doing what we doing, what we were doing then, including the universal masking. That's I know the masking is a bit of a bummer since we were all really glad to get vaccinated and have those go away, but we need to keep in mind that a huge chunk of our students are not vaccinated and can't be vaccinated yet. Um, and the American Association of Pediatrics has kind of elaborated on how to balance all of those things. So um, it says all students older than two years old and all school staff should wear face masks at school unless medical or developmental conditions prohibit use. The AAP recommends universal masking in school at this time for the following reasons. A significant portion of the student population is not eligible for vaccination. Protection of unvaccinated students from COVID-19 and to reduce transmission. Um, a lack of system to monitor vaccine status among students, teachers, and staff. Potential difficulty in monitoring or enforcing mask policies for those who are not vaccinated. In the absence of schools being able to conduct this monitoring, universal masking is the best and most effective strategy to create consistent messages, expectations, enforcement, and compliance without the added burden of needing to monitor vaccination status. In addition to that, there's the possibility of low vaccination uptake within the surrounding school community. 
and continued concerns for variants that are more easily spread among children, adolescents, and adults. So um, I would just mention that our vaccine uptake rates in young people in the Brookings community are, are low. They're um, very much too low that we can count on any kind of herd immunity from them, even in the older age groups that are vaccinated or, do, or have the possibility of being vaccinated. Um, and there was one other thing I was thinking. Of. Oh, the last thing I would just add as a personal note. So, um, you know, I, I know that you get a lot of emails from a lot of different people with all sorts of different opinions on how this should be done. So that's why I was just bringing in the CDC and the American Association of Pediatrics, since those are bodies that have put a lot of thought into figuring out the most effective strategies for schools for fall. Um, and not based on feelings necessarily, but on the scientific evidence. And I have family members myself who, who don't support masking or vaccination. And in fact, I just had a relative go into the ICU yesterday and be put on extracorporeal life support. Um, and, and I just watched that family in the span of a couple of days switch from thinking that it was somehow some kind of a political infringement on them to be asked to vaccinate or to wear a mask to all of a sudden watching their family member basically die. And, and, and it's just a really painful thing for me to watch as a scientist to be like, um, we have the science to make good decisions, so let's use it and not have to find things out the hard way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have um, Dr. Roger DeGroot here um, as a farewell item. Well, I promise you it won't be five minutes. I'm going to set the timer now. <laughs> it just didn't seem right. I couldn't be here at the July board meeting, and I just wanted to come in, in and visit with you folks and say that the last three years have been interesting, and I've, I really enjoyed working with four of you. You weren't on the board, Kelly, uh, during that time. Um, we disagreed on occasions, but I think we all respected each other you know, during that period of time. Um, I'm just going to go off text a little bit. I believe that last, I thought last year was going to be a tough year for the Brookings School District with COVID. I'm much more concerned about our district this year than last year because this variant attacks small children and young people. That being said, you have a tough job ahead of you. I also want to thank the uh, community for giving me the opportunity, you know, to sit on the board for the three years. It's, it's different on that side of the fence make the decisions over here and then you then you kind of approve the decisions over here but i've enjoyed that that process very much when i decided not to run someone asked me if i had accomplished everything that i set out to accomplish when i ran for the board and i told that person at that time yes i thought i had and i forgot about that darn calendar clint i mean you know that calendar that we need to finalize that's not done but then i also went on to think about what faces this district in the future, the challenges that you have, and I think the board should research a few things. And number one, um, and we've talked about this before, and I think some things have been done at the administrative level, but maybe the board just haven't tripped the trigger on it. And these are not negative. These are just some concerns that I have that I think the board should continue to look at. I believe we should exit interview all our parents and, uh, and upper grade students when they leave, leave the district. That, that would give us an idea. Are they leaving for uh, job advancements? Um, there, there's several different reasons, but I think that would give the board, well, they're leaving because of this. The other thing I think you should do, and it's all about exit interviewing, is see how well, and how well, <laughs> sorry about that, and how well we're doing it as, as a district and, and as a board. Um, we have several staff members leaving every year, and I, I just think it's just imperative that we exit interview those folks and see why they're leaving, especially if they're retirement, easy, they check it. But if they're going to another school district like a, a Harrisburg or an Arlington or, or Volga, we should know, we should know that. And then lastly, and, and this one kind of sneaks up on us as, as board members, but we approve resignations and hiring of new administrators all the time without stopping to think about the number that we've actually lost or replaced over the last five years. I, I wrote it down and I come up with between, depends on who you count, 
but there's somewhere around 20 administrators over the five years that have come and gone. And maybe we should hire a firm that would do an unbiased, you know, exit interview of those folks and see why they left. You know, did they retire? Uh, did they get a, a job advancement? But I just think that's necessary as a board and even as a, at the administrative level to know why, you know, one point in time, Brookings administration, you get a job there, that was a destination. Now it seems a little bit, it's not a negative, but some it's a revolving door. This building we sit in, we have, we're under fourth administrator in six years. Camelot is three in, in the amount of time that's been open. You can go through it, special ed is on the third and so on and so forth. What, what is the reason for that? I, I just think that's important. Again, the calendar, I'm gonna press on with that because I think that's important to all board members to get that calendar ready to go. Uh, so you know when what is due, and so you don't get caught off guard. I wish you a great school year. I hope COVID would just disappear. I have to deal with it. And I said this before, whatever decision you make, it's not going to be the right one because you're going to please 50% and you're going to not please the other 50%. Good luck. I enjoyed working with you. Uh, I haven't thrown my signs away yet, but it uh, goes in a shed for a year or two. So anyway, thank you, guys. Roger, Roger, thank you. It's been it was great working with you. It was a lot of fun, as well as very productive, and your insight was critical. Um, I don't want to miss what I maybe did or did not hear. You said exit interview for all parents of students, as well as uh, leaving uh, faculty. Is that what you said? You know, that some school districts exit interview their senior class going into college, man, that's pretty common. Um, but if you look at our history, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, you know the numbers better than I do, our, our student enrollment hasn't grown over the last five years. That's highly unusual for Brookings, highly unusual for most any other school in the area. They're all growing. There's got to be a reason for that. Now, is it open enrollment? I mean, I, can, I think you need to have somebody look at it. We've opened a couple of parochial schools in town. How many is that? But that should catch up sooner or later when they get into fourth grade. We should get those kids all back in. So, yeah, exit interview the families, ex why they're not coming to school here. Uh, that might give you some insight. It might be as simple as, uh, I know the answer to this, so I'm, but I'm not going to tell you, it might be open enrollment or going out and coming in, but that's not true. Your, both seniors and anybody that's leaving during this school. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Which is basically just knowing what your customers are looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Why did, um, it's a quick electronic thing. Kid, they, they left. They didn't come back in the fall. Send it out to them. Why did you not come back? That's simple enough. I mean, that's not rocket scientist. science. Lots of school districts do those kinds of things. Better handle on what's happening in your district. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, that's the last item for our community um, audience communication. Moving on, 6.1 is a presentation and progress update from Architecture, Inc. If you'd like to go ahead and step forward, and you'll just want to make sure that the microphone is very close to your mouth. Yeah, good evening. Uh uh, I'm Steve Jastrom, and this is Brian Field. We're with Architecture Incorporated, and I want to give you a quick update on the progress of our study. Uh, first off, I want to thank you uh, as a school board and the district for giving us the opportunity to work on your school. It's a privilege and an honor that we take very seriously, and we thank you, and we're going to give it our, do our very best. I want you to know that, so thank you. Um, we're off and running very well on the study. We're gathering a lot of information. Um, we've had uh, multiple meetings. Brian's going to even talk about some more of them. But meeting with the principals at each of the schools, Hillcrest and Madary, very good input from them. What's even better yet is we had an open forum with their teachers who could come and talk to us. And there were multiple teachers who came. Teachers always have good suggestions. They always do. Um, that worked out well. We've also had some meetings with other city outside of the school district, uh, city development director and um, 
as well as economic director so far. Getting, we're getting input from, from everyone. There's more meetings scheduled um, as well. Um, we've also reviewed both elementary schools in terms of physically reviewing all the, the structure of the building, looking at the exterior walls, the roof, the, uh, the roofs, the windows, etc. We've reviewed all the rooms as to educationally, in our opinion, which ones have some deficiencies that are too small or don't work right. And of course, we heard a lot about from teachers which ones are too hot, which ones are too cold. That's the way it always works. Uh, but we've done a very thorough review of them. Our mechanical and electrical engineers have reviewed both schools as well uh, to c come up. And they'll be coming up with a report of their recommendations of improvements that would need to be done to both of those schools as well. And we, of course, will have a, a full architectural a report of the structure of the building and some of the deficiencies that, that we see. And then, of course, uh, as we soon will have the recommendations and the options that we have for the, the different facilities, because there are, we definitely see options occurring already. We just don't have them all prepared for you tonight, but we will real soon because we want to make sure we get all of the information from everybody before we can give you some appropriate suggestions. Um, and Brian, do you want to mention about some of the other contacts with sure. the school? Um, our initial meeting was with the district leadership team a few weeks back. And then since then, um, I serve as an educational specialist, having recently retired as a school superintendent after 14 years. And uh, one of the first meetings we had was at Hillcrest, again, with Mr. Olinger, the principal. And then we also had an open forum, like Mr. Jastrom said, and we had about eight staff members that came in, gave them a two-hour period to come in and share what they felt were some strengths and of their school and what some areas for growth were as far as facilities and needs and things like that. Uh, one thing I want you to be aware of is there's a lot of pride for Hillcrest. There's a lot of pride for Madari amongst your staff, and that was very clear that came out. Um, are there concerns and things that are needed at both facilities? Yes. Um, also, a few days later, we went to Madari and got to meet with Mr. Grunhagen for an hour. Uh, we also had a couple of architects on that. Uh, interview as well. And then about another six to eight staff members came in during that two hour slot. Um, the staff members that came in included regular ed teachers, it included SPED educators. Um, we also had a phone interview with a school psychologist, uh, librarian, and uh, gave them an opportunity, custodial also. So it was a not just teachers, it included classified staff and things too. So basically, what I've been doing, I'm on my uh, MacBook Air and I'm just documenting and taking notes on everything. And then when that's done, I prepare a report for all the people at Architecture Incorporated as well. And eventually um, I'll have recommendations and things too. So we've met with Hillcrest staff, we've met with Madari staff, and then we also meet with key stakeholders and things in the community too. Um, and some of these names we obtained when we had our initial um, district leadership uh, meeting with Dr. Willard, Mr. Luters, and some of the principals as well too. Um, this afternoon, uh, we were able to meet with the Brookings Community Development Director, Mike Strzok, and uh, the GIS Specialist, uh, Aaron Carl. Got a lot of great information from them about the growth of Brookings and not only population growth, housing growth. Uh, we also met today um, at 4 o'clock with uh, Andrew Slaus from the Brookings Economic Development Corporation. Got a lot of good information from him, too, that we're going to be pulling into the reports and things, too. Um, our meetings are by no means done. Um, we'll be setting up other meetings uh, during the next week or two here in the Brookings community with other stakeholders in the community as well. Um, I continue to gather information on mass customized learning, um, educational adequacy, equity, um, early childhood education, special education, um, things like that as well. Um, and uh, so I'll be visiting with the uh, Director of Curriculum and Instruction who also serves as the LO coordinator for the district too. Um, I'll be visiting too uh, with your technology director and things too. So uh, not all the meetings are done yet. It's a work in progress, but uh, um, I want you to know you have a lot of pride uh, for Brookings schools and specifically for Madari and Hillcrest Elementary Schools. So it's been a lot of fun to visit with community members and school staff about those potential projects for the future. Do you have any questions? Well, <clears throat> how do you anticipate dealing with the issue of uh, changing boundaries, if, if at all? 
Yeah, um, next week, and I'll let maybe Mr. Jastrom Jasper, uh, address this too, but uh, we've done a lot of driving around this afternoon after we got done too, because obviously that's a challenge uh, in, in a community of this size as well too. But uh, we do not have all the answers on that. Uh, we are going to meet with some district leadership uh, next week to discuss that a little bit further. Some ide initial ideas that we might have, but I'll let Mr. Jastra maybe address that a little further. Well, and just to add to that, um, you know, we, we want to review the different options that you can have and make some, we can make some proposed revisions to it, but we understand very clearly it's a very, it's a sensitive issue because it's your town, it's your school. We understand that. We're going to be looking at the numbers and looking at it, where the numbers are, where kids are, what potential growth is, and then we, we can make some suggestions to you. We just want to meet with the administration staff as to how it's, uh, how we present that to the board, to you, and how that's discussed, and how we get input from the community, because you need input from the community uh, before any decisions, final decisions are made on that, which you as a board, of course, make. But we want to get all the info to help you make a logical decision. And that's what we're truly trying to focus on. We can make some suggestions, but you know your constituents better than anybody. We just need to give you the info to help you make a good decision. And that's how we're proceeding with it. Oh, uh, Clint, are we, um, we're definitely going to um, address the issue of, of redistricting, aren't we, at some point in time? Or is this, is this uh, something that we postponed a year ago and now is going to go away because of this work that Park Inc. is doing? Um, great question. We, if you recall, when the RFP was put together, um, wove that discussion of the attendance boundaries as one of the items that would be addressed through this process with the intent that before we would do any sort of construction or reconstruction or anything of that sort, we really needed to identify the, the scope of need um, based on the number of students that would be attending, whether it's Hillcrest or Madary. Um, so, so that's all integrated as part of this package. Um, so it was really woven into this with the intent that through this process we get to a solution but then can be shared within the community and move to a board action if we need to change attendance boundaries at all and to what extent. I just have one additional question. I wasn't able to ask you all questions. I was in the back that evening. But um, Brian, nice to meet you and see you. Uh, who do you utilize for kind of like a human development or early childhood sort of resource and connect with and and maybe you guys have a team of people um, when you presented I didn't notice that I'm I really want to focus on what we know about kids that are that age and sure. how we design spaces for kids that age so maybe who are your go-to people when you think about that sure well, uh, one of the people that I'll be visiting with too is uh, uh, Mr. Kevin Nelson who is a longtime elementary principal in Beersford and uh, now works for South Dakota Public TV and he uh, was part of the initial preschool standards that were developed uh, for South Dakota along with SASD Executive Director Rob Munson. So I know they have been doing that and conducting reviews in some communities for their early childhood programs that exist in the communities. Um, I also know Brookings is part of a early childhood, I don't want to call it a coalition, but there's a, there's yep, a name I'm for on it. That, I'm on that group okay. with Kevin, so group, yeah. Okay, so that's one of communities. the resources okay. I think that would be very strong. They call them preschool standards of excellence is what they call them. So he'll be an important resource, I think, to look for um, as he travels throughout the state, along with uh, Rob Munson, too. Um, you know, I think those would be two important resources. Um, I'm by no means an expert in early childhood education, but certainly there's people out there that are. Thank you. One other thing I've done um, is I've been analyzing uh, Brookings School District and specifically Madari and Hillcrest Elementary School. I've collected 10 years of demographic information too and that'll all be part of the report that gets shared too from Architecture Incorporated too. So you can maybe see enrollment trends um, student population wise but maybe in special education. Uh, the number of ELL students um, in the district and things like that too. Open enrollments 
homeschool, all those different things is part of the 10-year demographics that I've been collecting and gathering too. That'll be shared in the report for your review as well. I'm going to throw my two cents in here too. Um, I just attended a conference with several of our teachers and administrators on reimagining education. And it really is going beyond what has been labeled as MCL and just looking at a variety of best practices that really involve students working together, collaborating. So a traditional classroom may not be the learning space that would work best for that, those types of, of, of strategies and methodologies. So um, I guess I just want to throw out there that I'd like you to be very visionary in thinking about this because when we're doing this remodel, it's going to have to last us for far beyond the years that any of us are sitting here will still be on the board. And so we want to make sure that it's a learning space that grows with, that can grow with the times, that can be flexible and provide those collaborative learning environments. Um, so I'll be plugging for that along the way and I'll wait when I'm checking in with you. <laughs> Thank you. And excuse me, speaking of plugging, um, I'm going to be plugging Mary O'Neill. Have you resourced her yet? And um, no, uh, her name has come up several times at SDSU, and uh, we are going to be reaching you know, out to when her you, as well. When Steve and you put that stuff together, Brian, it um, um, you know you've got a lot of good data sources, and they've got a lot of stuff that'll come together. And boy, I'd sure like to have her sit down with you once you got the whole pile in front, the whole pile in front of you. And, um, and I think she could be helpful. Whether she's a source, whether she's a source piece or whether she's a review piece, that's. Um, we, I personally think she'll be both. <laughs> she's gonna have great information from what we've heard that she'll provide us from bef even before in the history of this. And then we'd also like to bounce our, our ideas off of her. So I see her doing both for us to help us. And your and your school. Do you anticipate having any community um, input for the boundary issue? And I only ask because we had a pretty significant committee set up. Um, how many years ago was it now? Several years ago, where we had a really nice collaboration between staff and community, and we brought a lot of voices to the table. And unfortunately, we weren't able to resolve the item at that time. But I know that, just like you said, it is something that's very important and near, to, near and dear to the hearts of the people in the community. And so I'm just curious if that's going to be part of the plan. Uh, definitely. We want to have community meetings and probably multiple ones to do that. We would just like to work with you and your administration as to how exactly do we set that up. And like the community, the, the committee that you mentioned, that kind of did it maybe years before. We, we see a similar format, but we'd like to work with you to get it organized in the most logical way. But we definitely plan on having at least two community meetings um, um, to hear from the public. It's just, you know, that sometimes when we've done these or been involved with them before, there's been some suggestions and give information as to why some things are recommended, but we want to hear from the community and we will, we are planning on doing that. It's just we want to coordinate to do it in a logical way. Okay, it's, uh, it's August 9. So what, what can this board expect in terms of the, the demographic, the boundary, uh, in terms of is it data or what, what is it? What, what is it that we're, we're looking at by, uh, by the end of the month? Well, we, we are definitely by the end of the month going to have all the demographic information together and our recommendations for buildings as to what could maybe happen and our options for that, um, which includes everything on the educational standards, which relate to learning centers and how you can best do that for the future. Um, uh, and then we'll also have like projections of numbers that we're going to be reinforcing. We can have some options for you for the school boundaries, but I don't want you to, in my opinion, I mean, you as the school board can handle this in your, the, the speed or time you want, but you know, that one you want to have some options, present it to the public, get some information back, and then you make some decisions. So, but we, we're going to make some suggestions by the end of the month. 
for sure. But again, that's not your final no. boundary changes, but we, we can make some suggestions based on the information that we've already been gathering. Well, this is not, uh, you know, the first um, rodeo relative to boundaries that go back, I go back <laughs> 25 years and we've had these several times and, yeah. and uh, probably a lot more hiccups than we had to have solutions. And, um, and so we have to be careful that we don't have um, real misinformation and whatever else out there relative to what could happen until, uh, until we um, get to the point where we need to make a decision or look at options to get the public's input. So three weeks isn't a lot of time, but on the other hand, maybe it's just enough to understand where we're at and, and without this board being expected to make a decision. I don't, I don't know, I guess that's, the, that's the, what's out there, so. Agree, I, we, we, uh, we'll come back with uh, some options here for you or our, some of our recommendations on that. But again, you know, to make sure it's understood by everyone in the public as well, they're just some, some of our recommendations based on the information. It still needs your community review, no question. That's, in some cases, that's more important than the, than the scientific data, is the community input. So I do see that process taking longer than the end of the month before you make any final decisions. But we'll, st we'll have some to start the discussion. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion. More so there than whether Millie like, Dairy needs a roof or not. <laughs> <laughs> but Dairy needs a new roof. I can tell you that right now. Okay. <laughs> you, you are right. Any other questions from the board? Dr. Willard? Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We appreciate that. All right, next up is our committee um, reviews. I'll go through these relatively quickly and um, just speak up as we get to your committee if you have an update to provide. Performance Oversight Committee. Um, I just spoke with Brian and we're going to, I'll be going in this week because I believe we have um, auditors coming next week. So I want to make sure I'm checking him out before then. <laughs> Perfect. Facilities and Construction Committee. Well, we have a new member, and I think we're kind of waiting for some of this to play out, and then we'll probably be meeting uh, on a regular basis. So. Good. Policy and Governance Committee. We had, um, uh, you and I had one meeting on the 3rd of August, and we get ready for the <coughs> previous meeting, and uh, more coming. You betcha. The Human Rights Ad Hoc Committee. I imagine we'll have more on shortly moving forward. Negotiations Ad Hoc Committee. Goal Finance Ad Hoc Committee. Sorry, yeah. Um, finance, yeah. We've had, um, Wes and I have had two meetings, um, one on the 4th and one on the 9th. And the 9th, of course, is today. We're just trying to do as much as we can to prepare for uh, what was in the board back, understanding it and going through that. So um, that's what we were doing, two meetings. Intergovernmental Relations Ad Hoc Committee, have they had another meeting since? Mental Health Coalition? Uh, we did not have a July meeting and we are meeting this Wednesday. Um, for a little bit longer meeting, so I'll have something to report at our next board meeting. Um, this is the time for general board member communications. I would just like to say that I really did enjoy being a part of the team that attended the Reimagining Education. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was a conference, it was really a part of a grant that our district has is, is a part of last week, and um, just the uh, positive attitudes of our staff, um, both teachers and administrators, and how we can move forward 
um, in doing having the best methodology in our teaching all across the system and it's just it was a really enjoyable conference and then um, I don't know if this is the time for it but I think based on um, we got some comments tonight from parents and I've gotten several emails today and text messages regarding our back to school plan and we don't have another board meeting scheduled for this month so I'm just thinking that maybe tonight we do need to look at maybe a special meeting just right before school starts because things are changing so quickly and for example the recommendation from the CDC and um, Medical Association and the Pediatric Association they, that's changed since our last board meeting which was only a week and a half ago so um, I think that's just something I was going to bring up at this time because there's really no other place on the agenda to do it um, I, I wanted to take a minute to uh, uh, talk about the Bobcat backer golf holding um, Paul was there Chris was there Mike was there um, I was there. I don't golf. I wouldn't golf to save my soul. My soul needs a lot of saving, but it is not going to be on the golf course. Um, so, uh, but I think the, uh, maybe you can help me out, one of you guys, but uh, I think the, uh, the roster was pretty well filled, that they had enough teams and as many teams as they wanted, and uh, presumably they had fun. Um, I heard uh, uh, Jason Schmidt behind me uh, grousing about his team not getting... Uh, not winning or something or other, but uh, all in, beautiful day, and I assume it was good outing. Were you, did you actually go on the course, Mike, or did you just? Uh... <laughs> well, it's, it's a good deal, and we, we certainly, as a, as a board, I can't speak for the board because we didn't talk about it ahead of time, but I, um, I have to say thank you to, uh, the leaders of the backers, and they've they've done some pretty material things last year or so, and and appreciate their enthusiasm. I should also add that Wes and Melissa and I attended. I, I attended just one day of the Associated School Boards meeting. Um, Dr. Will probably share a little bit about that too. That, but that was very interesting too. We heard from um, Secretary of Education um, Tiffany Sanderson, who shared with us information regarding. Um, the cannabis, medical cannabis, and how that's going to be carried out in our school systems, as well as some of the report that we're getting tonight. And then we, I went to some small group sessions, I think Melissa did too, um, which were very informative. And I know Wes and I were in one that was the same, okay. where we were talking about how we could engage the community. Or no, that one was on PBIS. Yep. Um, right. Which, you know, we were, I learned a lot about what that is because I knew that was something our district was looking into. So that was a, also a real positive which is problem-based intervention, correct? I got it. You took away my speech, so. <laughs> Actually, the, the, I, I attended a session on open meeting laws, and, and um, I don't think we're out of step much here in terms of our practices. I do believe uh, there are opportunities for communication that we can discuss at some point in time, but that don't, it would not violate the open meeting laws. So that's it. All right, a couple of mine already have been addressed. Um, I, I do want to thank the parents and community members for just their engagement. There's a, um, I think a healthy district is one where people are engaged and really paying attention and all are kind of gathering together for the success of the students. And I've really felt that in this last week. I've had a lot of communication, of course, differing opinions. Um, but at the heart of all of that communication was a very sincere intent um, that we all want the best for our students. And I appreciate that we're in a district where people will take the time to reach out and communicate their concerns and feedback, and I appreciate that. Um, one last thing, as you may have heard us allude to, we do have a change in committees um, set for approval tonight in discussion. Should it be approved, um, Van might need a little consolation later. If you see him walking around the community, he loves policy. And he loves reading and poring over that for hours and hours and hours. And if this does get approved, he will be spending less time poring over this policy with me. 
Yes, but I do. Why are, why are you taking it away from me? I mean, I, <laughs> I can't wait for uh, Amanda to get my tab my booklet back so I can. <laughs> well, I do want to thank you for reading all of those with me and being diligent and providing feedback and going through that because I know it's a lot and, and I appreciate that. Barb already thinks I'm a dull person. I don't understand <laughs> why. <laughs> Any other conversation? All right. Next up, superintendent will share information about events of the past month and topics coming up in the near future. Well, good evening, board members, community members, um, students that are eagerly anticipating the start of school. Um, there are a number of things to share and some things that have already been referenced and highlighted. Um, there are a couple of attachments that were added a bit late to the to my report that I did want to direct the board's attention to. Um, one is the ongoing conversation with Brookings Area Transit Authority, and um, Brenda did provide me a brief update this afternoon that I could just share with the board, and it reiterates the efforts that we started several months ago regarding a shared transportation facility. And she points to where we are now, which is Banner working with the consultant from TSP, doing some environmental assessments. They're considering local economic impact. Um, there's a need to do an update on the appraisal of the property that, that the district holds. Um, and then some finalization of a possible uh, lease sharing agreement with the school district and Brookings Area Transit Authority. What we have learned most recently, and this is why she felt compelled to share the information, is the South Dakota Department of Transportation has indicated that the discretionary grant application is going to be released relatively soon, and it could be, in fact, any time. Um, it takes about six weeks to complete that grant process, and <clears throat> we may need to have a special meeting or some work of the facility subcommittee meeting, a facility subcommittee of the board that would help navigate the relationship and the partnership going forward as beta looks to apply for one of those FTA grants. So um, no call for action this evening, more of an information piece and sharing with the board uh, so you are aware of our ongoing efforts and, and um, shared vision for a, for a combined transportation facility. Um, I think it's important to reemphasize what compelled us to have this conversation in the first place and it was identifying the needs that we have with our own transportation facility going back to that initial comprehensive master facility plan that was done I believe five or six years ago now and that was one of the top ten items on the list um, but then e equally the opportunity that has presented itself with the uh, federal funding option that would help diminish the shared costs that we have collectively because of some of the infrastructure and related costs that would go into constructing a new facility. So um, again, more of an information piece for the board. And then um, as was referenced in the uh, previous comments by board members, I did attach after receiving from uh, State Secretary of Education Sanderson the presentation that she provided in the joint convention um, and that was on August 5th that she provided this presentation. And those initial slides really speak to just the, the challenges, the dynamics of what we went through this last year. She did share some perspectives on the funding coming to local school districts through ESSER and the support to local school districts. And then they highlighted um, some of the key elements that um, really have come through from the state's assessment on where we are now and there was a need to uh, emphasize again the value of in-person education that was highlighted um, there was a recognition that there were some school districts that had uh, students with 30 days or greater of absences so a need to uh, look at engagement of students and our district was noted as a district that had um, district level percentage of students with 30 or more days of absence. And our range was between 5 and 10%. Um, I'm going to dig into that a little bit more and find out the exact percentage that may be attributed somewhat to our process of quarantining when we found that students were in local proximity to somebody that may have been a COVID positive or um, exposed to COVID. So 
Again, there, there's probably some other factors that relate to that, but that's something I think that warrants a little more examination. And ultimately, um, the Department of Education held a summit, and from that there were some recommendations that I think universally apply to some of the things that you see woven into our ESSER plan, which talks about engagement of students and families and how we actively engage both students and families through the educational process. Um, some ongoing supports for summer and after school programming and more of an emphasis on the summer instead of after school programming. I think the, the after school programming in Brookings we see um, certainly great partners like GAP and the Boys and Girls Club and uh, those are great partnerships that we have. Our extended activities with the summer obviously a relationship with the Boys and Girls Club as well. And then educator recruitment and retention, and we see that as an ongoing challenge, not only in Brookings, but also across the entire state. I think um, Secretary Sanderson spoke to the fact that over 120 vacancies on the Associated School Board's uh, website right now for teacher vacancies across the entire state of South Dakota, and it's August. So this is, uh, this is pretty alarming when you start thinking about that. But again, those, those are slides that you can look back and reference. Um, and then in the slide presentation, she does reference um, a document that is understanding the impact of COVID-19 on South Dakota K-12 education. I did include that document last week, and it was uploaded to the site. Again, it's a point of reference for the board. Um, that's a com accumulation of input that was provided uh, via survey to all the building principals, and that happened towards the tail end of the school year last year, and then that has been compiled to provide, if you will, an aggregate set of data um, from principals across the entire state, whether it was Bowdle or Brookings or, or Sioux Falls or Sturgis, it really was a accumulation of that data. So again, a, a pretty good document to reference and understand the state uh, as we look at it right now. Um, so those were a few things that I wanted to point to that were attachments specific to the um, other things that I wanted to report on. Uh, we'll be talking later on about the custodial agreement uh, that's before you for approval this evening. Uh, I just wanted to point to the watering agreement that we have and that we've entered into. If you haven't driven by the high school, you'll notice that the sod is down now and we have started our commitment to watering the sod. That is through a shared agreement with BMU and those school district. We have limitations on what we can uh, put onto the onto the property and managing and taking care of the asset of the sod. And really the question might be, well, why is the district even doing this in the first place? And it really comes back to student safety and well-being. That field is utilized for curricular type activities through the physical education. Uh, additionally, we know that we've had some changes in utilization of field space around the high school with the changes that have happened to Bob Sheldon. So this accommodates that. Um, there were holes and divots in the field. There were exposed sprinkler heads. What we've done is taken care of those and corrected those items and um, a lot of interest in that obviously. And not only for the fall, I know some people might say, well, this is all about a fall sport or fall activity. And I would, I would disagree with that because we have to remember that that is utilized in the spring as well and quite heavily for the number of track meets that we host in the community. So um, that's why that field was attended to the way that it was and, and the process that we've utilized. Um, as was mentioned before, COVID watch, we're, we're continuing that effort. And I just want to take a moment to restate what I believe is the obvious, but I think it's worth stating. And that we need to continue to show grace for everybody in this conversation. This is the third school year in a row that we'll be dealing with COVID. And where my realization came about, and some, of, some people heard me say this earlier today in a conversation I had, um, I sat down and did some math with my daughter, who was the 2020 uh, graduate, a 2020 graduate of Brookings that was impacted by this. 15% of her life as a student has been impacted by COVID. 15%. So if you start equating that to our most little people, our little people are going to watch the big people and how we react and respond to this. And if we continue to show grace and poise in how we respond and, and understanding that there's going to be um, disagreements, I would emphasize the point not to be disagreeable in those conversations. And I say that collectively 
around the room because um, some people are out there trolling and, and putting misinformation or misguided information or partial information. And it's really unfortunate because that does very little to support what we're trying to do, which is uh, provide a safe and secure learning environment for our kids given the circumstances that we have. I want to end on a positive note by stating that um, we did uh, find our way, several of us, into the dunk tank for National Night Out. That was a lot of fun. I do have to uh, let you know that I believe Tony Lanning, who is pictured in one of the pictures here and is actually present in the room, could be our pitching coach for the baseball team. Or uh, he, he, uh, he, he did pretty good. Um, I think I got knocked down at least three times, and then I gave, gave him one too. But uh, it was a fun night to support what the uh, local emergency management individuals and folks are doing for our community and for our students, and, and it supported a great cause um, as well. And, and then I'll just close as well by saying that the, the golf outing was a great event. Um, I can't say enough how much I appreciate how the backers step up and support all of our students and in, in what they do. And, and when you look at the investments that they've made, particularly into the weight training facilities, that has been impactful for students across the spectrum, whether you're in the fine arts or whether you're an athlete. Um, and that's, that's been really value added. And uh, I, I wouldn't say our team golfed as well as um, Jason's team did, but that's because we were getting a lot of pressure from them to play through quickly So uh, because they were behind us. So um, that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, <laughs> with that being said, I'll stand ready for any questions the board might have. Uh, one, one question I have, Clint, to, to help uh, further um, Melissa's uh, suggestion of how dense I am. Um, on the memo that you sent out, first one, Um, understanding the impact of COVID-19. Yes. You see that? Yep. Um, I just had a, a, a question on page seven. Um, there, was, um, there, were, there was a chart that said mitigation makes it possible. And what I don't get is, um, wouldn't that be an area to present uh, the uh, results of masking? It very well could have been, um, and I don't know that the state has compiled necessarily the, the school by school impact of masking. And again, this is a Department of Education report that was shared, so um, certainly one of those factors, though, that, that could have been highlighted. It does, it does appear in the Appendix A, but I'm just not sure how it all ties out, and I thought that they're, they're, they're there must be an obvious and simple answer that I'm that is beyond my grasp. Well, and I think it points to if you look at at school districts that were successful, and and I use that term, gauging whether or not a district was impacted by um, a shutdown or having to move to some level of hybrid or something. Uh, there was some value found in districts that did have a very consistently applied masking process, given the the impact of spread at the time. Now, right now, we know we're in a different circumstance, and we have a different approach right now. But as I said earlier today in my radio presentation with Perry Miller, that could be subject to change given the three factors that we're weighing, impact in our system, impact in our health care system, and certainly um, the, the spread within our broader community. So um, certainly some things that as we look at this report as a district, our, our full administrative team has not dissected this, um, but all of our administrators did contribute to this. So we want to peel into this a little bit more and understand some of those things that we can learn from and apply. All right, thank you, Dr. Willard. Next up, the Director of Business Services will report a financial overview of the previous month. Laura and I will just share the mic. Can you hear us both, Jason? Or Laura hasn't spoke yet, but all right, I'll get closer and then I'll turn it over to Laura. All right. Um, 
In lieu of our finance report, we're just going to cover the 21-22 budget brief overview, and then we'll cover some of the ESSER 2 and 3 expenses that are being proposed as well. Um, quick note, though, unless there were any questions on any board bills or any of the financial statements, we'll start with the budget presentation. All right, and it's going to be very short because there were very minimal changes to it from the last one presented in July. We'll go to the first slide, the graph. Um, just noted it's 26000 less than last month's presentation. So very, very little changes were made to it. Jump into the next slide. Um, same slide that was presented last month, obviously a new proposed budget amount of $24 million. $723,720. I made one change to this when I was reviewing the expenses. I noted that our utility expenses are going to be higher than expected. And the main one is there was a change I had to make to an electrical cost at the middle school and natural gas costs are going to be higher this year. So I, I changed the utility increases from $23,000 to $58,000. And that's the only change that was really made in the general fund. Next slide covering some information that will be covered at a later date. The ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 funding, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. I changed the estimated use of our fund balance. It was 460000 It's now 385000 And that includes a transfer in of 463500 from capital outlay, which reduced our use of fund balance from 848000 Other options that we'll discuss at a later date. Uh, possible district insurance holiday, and ESSER 2 to fund a staff bonus. Capital outlay. This slide did not change at all. So unless there's any questions, I'll jump to the next slide. This slide, I did make two changes on the dollar sign. Um, the board members had requested to put the principal's in, amounts remaining. So the middle school principal amount remaining on that capital outlay certificate 22,415,000 and the Camelot principal remaining on that addition is 240,000. Next slide, I did make just a few changes. I added one more salmon color to line 15, 16 and 17. Um, we're going to cover that in much de greater detail on the next slide. We're going to be talking about deferred maintenance. So I just wanted to make that note on this slide as well. Any questions so far? Uh, now, the deferred maintenance, this was brought up at the last board meeting. This is something that the board and administration have been working on. One of the things we want to do is try and set aside, the goal is to set aside 2% of our estimated cost to replace all of the district buildings. And right now, our estimated cost of all the buildings in the district are about $116 million. 2% of that's 2329000 And I put the corresponding lines on the previous slide so you can review back if you're interested Checking that out as well. But uh, so we'd like to set our goal is to set two million three hundred and twenty nine thousand aside to do deferred maintenance, such as put a new roof on, replace a boiler, carpet, etc., throughout the district. Of our twenty one twenty two budget, the amounts we have for deferred maintenance are one hundred and eighty four thousand two hundred twenty five dollars, which when the middle school was built, the uh, estimated cost of that was twenty the middle school renovation slash um, uh, remodel that we did a couple years ago. The estimated cost of that was $24,256,000. We asked the architects to determine how much of that was deferred maintenance, and they came up with $3,684,000. The balance of the certificate was 20 years, so we took that amount divided by 20 years, and we came up with $184,000 the district is putting towards renovations or deferred maintenance every year as part of that 2.3 million I mentioned earlier. So that's, I just wanted to give you a recap of where we came up with that number. And this is the sort of stuff as to why we go to the meetings in the morning and talk it over. <laughs> we got that all explained to us and I think Wes and I are, are comfortable with the presentation. Yep. And, and yes, and Van and Wes have been instrumental in assisting with us with this as and well. And I might add that as far as capital outlay, we're gonna be talking about this at great length as we uh, go into looking at the resources we have for our uh, projects our Madaria and Hillcrest. So this, uh, this, this, some of these numbers are going to be, uh, we're going to be looking at them again and again in terms of um, what kind of, what kind of uh, funds we have um, for long term. 
Wes is correct. And as part of this budget included in this is a million one hundred twenty-five thousand. Which a portion of that could be used for Madera Hillcrest renovations as well, or other districts' um, expenses for deferred maintenance. And there's one hundred fifty-five thousand for the district deferred maintenance and grounds. One of the things we're looking at doing is replacing some asphalt and concrete, concrete which will go towards that one hundred fifty-five thousand. And we also, as part of each building's budget, have a certain amount in repairs. Each year, and there's about 229,000 set aside for if a boil, uh, not a boiler, but say an air hand, not an air handler, something small, a compressor would go out and it's 2,000 to replace it. A hot water heater would go out and it's 5,000 to replace it. Those are other deferred maintenance items that would come up as well. So right now we have about 1,693,000 allocated towards our deferred maintenance. You can see we're short by about 635,000. So we haven't met our goal yet. But as our debt gets paid off in future years on that five-year capital outlay plan, you see we're starting to strive and we'll get closer and closer to that goal as each year goes on. Brian, um, tomorrow you might look at uh, that, that um, like 1125000 on line 13. I think it might be a different line. Um, so you may want to reconcile that. Um, I'll do that, man. Yeah, it's yep. it's it's not important. I mean, okay. it's just to sort of true it up. So, right, and the time. um, the the shortage, the six hundred thousand uh, shortage, is something that uh, Wes and I have clearly understood and been working with for the last uh, several months. It's 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 we 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 see it coming with uh, some of the things you just spoke about, uh, Brian. Yep, and each year we've been getting closer to that, and we will reach it, but it'll take a couple of years. All right, in the special education fund, just one change. Uh, we went and reviewed um, with Heather all, and uh, Renee helped us immensely as well. Went through and reviewed all the staff that are in place for next year. And when going through it, um, found about 69,000 that we could reduce. I, when we're going through, we look at the staff that we currently have, and so there were some changes. And so I was able to reduce the special education budget by about 69,000. Um, one of the things I did want to note is the use of fund balance did drop. It's now 465,000. It was 537,000. Um, one of the things that we'll be meeting with Heather is there's a chance some of these staff that are in this year's budget, if they're new staff, she does have additional funding through IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And so we may be able to move some of those staff to be federally funded this year as well to help reduce our um, reliance on fund balance and extraordinary cost fund. And again, ESSER funding also will be supplemented at a later date. All right, moving on to bond redemption. Um, the only thing we changed on this slide was adding the principal balance. So Dakota Prairie is 11760 And then Camelot's principal balance is 3505 And then capital projects. Fund 51 is for the MMS Mickelson Middle School addition renovations. The budget is 265000 because there is one summer project left to be invoiced and paid for. And after that is um, taken care of, the fund will be closed out, and we're estimating a uh, carryover of that project of 881000 And as mentioned earlier, the food, the food Service Enterprise Fund and Self-Insurance Fund, those budgets stayed the exact same amount. Excuse me, Enterprise went up a little bit. It was $132,825. It went up to $140,000. That was for summer camps. Last year, summer camps dipped with COVID, and it looks like they're starting out pretty strong this year. So that uh, expenses went up in revenue as well. But one thing I did want to note that is very interesting to me as well as um, when we met this morning, our federal revenue next year is proposed to be a million four hundred five thousand. Looking back pre-COVID, it's about seven hundred fifty thousand more than it was uh, eighteen nineteen. It's amazing the difference in revenue. Of course, obviously our local revenues drop because all the meals are free now. But it's just an interesting note to point out to the board that uh, it's a change. the budget's almost the same, but the revenues flipped from federal or from local to federal. Other than that, unless there was any questions, I apologize it was brief, but there are very few changes to it. 
Any questions from the board? All right, thank you so much. And now we'll jump to the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3. And Dr. Willard, myself, and Laura will be kind of jumping in throughout this with various responses or questions that uh, we feel are necessary that might be answered as we go along. Not going to be able to read that unless you want to. How would the board like us to proceed? Do you want us just to kind of re go th recap them all again as well, or do you, is there any particular subject you'd like us to start on, S or two, S or three, or any particular line item, or what do you think, Dr. Wilkes? Should we just start at the top? Yeah. All right. Oh yes, Laura will cover the color coding. And actually, before we do any of that, Brian, why don't we restate um, what S or two and S or three are? Clarify. Um, some of the timelines, because I know there have been some questions about uh, when this all transpired, how it transpired, and then um, kind of the, the hard deadline that we have of August 20th that we learned about today. I think, I think understanding all of that and then going through each of the items in particular may, uh, may help us understand how we need to move forward potentially. All right, good, good, good idea. We'll start. I'm going to just briefly cover ESSER 1. ESSER 1 was about 550000 We do have some money left over in that fund. Um, one of the um, some staff questions brought up by our staff are what can we still buy PPE? There is money that we would most likely use ESSER 1 for to pay for that PPE equipment. And that fund ends 2022, September 2022. Now, ESSER 2, we've gotten uh, an allocation of 2250000 that has to be expended by September 2023. And ESSER 3, uh, 3,233,000, that has to be spent by September 2024. And we're gonna try and set it up as we spend to spend ESSER 1 first, ESSER 2, and then we'll finish up with ESSER 3. They may be commingled together. Um, you'll see spots where we start out with ESSER 2 and then we jump them down to ESSER 3. A good example of that is the social worker. She started out in ESSER 1 and she's in ESSER 2, and then she jumps down to ESSER 3. And that's that way we did that so that we can keep paying for that position as long as possible. And ESSER 2, ESSER 3, and ESSER 1 all pretty much have the same standards of stuff we have to follow for it be related to COVID and student learning, getting them caught up to where they should be. Um, I'm just trying, I missed anything. Oh, the, and yes, the, as Dr. Willard mentioned, the, the deadline is very important. We have to have it in by August 20th. We have to have it in. Um, and it, ESSER 2 ties in, so the two both have to be uploaded by August 20th. Okay, so starting out with ESSER 2, of that 2250000 we're proposing to add the BHS 1 to 1 lease. We've been talking about this um, for several months. Um, it's $268,500 over the next three years, and that amount would be, the nice thing is it helps supplement our general fund use of fund balance. So it was, it was tied in with our um, increases for staff last year as part of the negotiations. The district social worker, that's um, around $70,500, and it jumps up each year for a, we did plug in a raise, I should add that. That's why the staff amounts increase each year. We just estimated, I want to say 3%. We don't know what the state's going to give us, but it's just an estimate right now, so that's why they bump up 3% each year. So there's an increase for that as well. But the social worker starts out 21, 22, 22, 23, and then jumps to ESSER 3 as the last remaining year of the social worker. And that position um, most likely will remain after that. The other ones, um, when we do advertise for them, that will be noted that they're a federal grant. It's for three years, and the positions would end after the three years, so that people that are applying for those positions would know that. The Studer Group, that is a independent contractor that would be the district pro provides support for. It's about fifty-seven thousand a year, and it would help us with our continuous improvement leadership team. Uh, or our focus culture in the Brookings School District, and they will also help us with our. Um, strategic plan as well and the surveys that would follow. On the staff bonus, that's something that was paid in the, in the 2021 year. We found out we can get uh, funding for that as well. It would help us with our user and reduce of, use of fund balance in the general fund as well. 
technology. This is a, I think this is a great thing to add. It would be 500,000 for equipment for student devices. I think Jason's goal is to try to get as close as we can to one-to-one. To one. And if I'm wrong, correct me, Jason, but I believe I'm right on that. It would be used to buy technology for students. Staff development and training. That's 150,000 for 21, 22, and 22, 23. What we would envision doing with that is hey, paying. Brian, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, is there fine. any way you could make that bigger for the audience to it's see? It's horribly small. I apologize. Agreed. Thank you. There you go. That's good. And is that, hopefully that's good enough. It won't slide all the way over to the right, but it'll give you the idea where we're going down. Anyway, staff development, what the idea behind that would be is to pay teaching staff and possibly other staff if they're interested, but mostly teaching staff to come in and learn how to do, say, PBIS or some other incentive or um, plan that the district has for um, helping students get caught up in the, uh, with their uh, learning curves or whatever. I'm trying to just think of a good word. Uh, I'm struggling a little bit, I apologize. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to this. Um, so staff development is, is just what it infers, that it's supporting our staff. And one of the items, and, and you'll notice the specific reference to the Danielson framework, for example, and going back to um, the REM colloquium that we were part of, out in Chamberlain recently, one of the items that was identified was the reality that we have embraced the Danielson framework as our model for teacher evaluation. And we have not done much systemically and systematically to train staff about the different levels. There's four levels in the Danielson framework. We could do a whole board meeting talking about this framework. but helping staff understand what the Danielson framework calls for and and what it is is really helping understand that the observables are what the students are doing well how do we help and support and train our staff relative to the framework and I know there was some uh, work that was done with training in the Danielson framework and I'll call Paul up a little bit later on to speak to some of this as well um, when we talk about how everything kind of fits together there's there's some things specific to um, maybe some narrative relative to why are we uh, reducing four positions at the high school but yet looking at eight positions for example as we get into SR3 but he could also talk to some of the value of the staff training that occurred last year with the Danielson framework I think it was a very value added added piece of staff development that's one example of others that you see up here and and um, we know we're going to be getting some information later on from the search survey and we have some opportunities to provide some supports for staff on how to work with and, and provide student support in how staff communicate and work with students because our, our students are carrying a tremendous amount of baggage today. And we also know that there's tough conversations that happen in a very politically charged climate and environment. And how do we effectively support and train staff to have those conversations in a way that's meaningful and and intentional so um, any number of things that support curriculum or excuse me that support staff development thank you dr. Weller did a much better job I'm not a curriculum person so thank you um, number 10 the increased school nurse hours that is something oh sorry curricular support I apologize I missed that that is a, a K a pre-k through 5 director of curriculum support and instruction and that it's, it's 90,000 for this year because we know that position would not be able to be hired right away we're gonna wait until the grant gets approved by the state and so and then it would carry on for 22 23 24 in that would basically do the same uh, position as Michelle Vandy words they would split you do 6 12 that would be pre-k 5 and this is a topic that has been discussed numerous times at this board table saying that wouldn't it be nice if we could have a a curriculum director for our pre-k-5 as we work on organizational alignment of standards and instructional practices 
um, and understanding the role that assessments, both summative and formative, have in this educational process. So the, the vision is that would support those efforts, again, within our system. And then the last one on ESSER 2 is increased school nurse hours. That is one thing we had heard we did it last year. Um, and then the, also proposing it this year came from principals as well as staff to increase those hours for the nurses to have them there for at least seven, seven and a half hours a day. It's 35,000, but because they're switching from a five hour position to a seven, they now qualify for benefits. So we'll have to issue new work agreements. Um, it's approved to increase their hours as well. I should note, ESSER 2 is the same as ESSER 3 in this sense. Any money, these are all estimates. So for example, if we end the year and we either overspend ESSER 2 by say 50,000 or underspend by 50,000, or change um, some philosophy and something, we can always amend the budgets and submit them to the state as an amendment. The difference is ESSER 2 of the district just does. ESSER 3, we have to re-upload our plan. It's, ESSER 3 is very open and it, you have to get input on everything. So if, for example, in ESSER 3, we 21-22, um, we'd happen to not spend 50,000 or whatever amount it may be. We'll have to su supplement the budget, but also post it to the website any proposed changes we're making to get input from the public, as well as the school board and various stakeholders in the district. So jumping to ESSER 3, unless there's any questions on ESSER 2. Covered the social worker already. That's proposed 23-24. Student groups been covered, curriculum support. The district meant health counselor those that's a two full-time positions I should add those are in brown we would add them as soon as possible once the board would approve it we would start advertising almost immediately we feel that's a very critical position there's two other critical positions coming up I'll cover those when we get to them but the mental health counselors are we feel are very important to us because there's some mental health needs in the district um, if you want, I can cover them, but I think they're kind of self-explanatory. Um, power up, that's something the school district does um, with Boys and Girls Club. We could either look at enhancing it or using it to supplement what we currently spend through Boys and Girls Club. Bus video surveillance, that's updating our cameras on our buses. Um, what it would help do is, one of the big things is with contact tracing. We can, our cameras are getting older, they're not always accurate and on. And so this would update our systems to make it a little bit more tech savvy as well as make sure they're working at 100 percent capacity number 19 uh, the success interventionists i'm not going to call them success makers anymore um that was my air by the way anyway um did you want to cover that Dr. Uh, I, I can comment briefly um and i would like to emphasize the word interventionist that this is really supporting students that have been identified as having some sort of gap in their academic achievement. And the idea would be um, really targeting those needs through an assessment of data through NWA results, for example. Uh, also looking at teacher input and teacher feedback. And it could be um, similar in some regards to a Title I program where a student may be identified, there's very specific and targeted interventions that are provided, and then the student is, is moving along accordingly. Um, the idea is that these are certified teaching positions in the district, and they would be structured. Um, you'll notice there's eight. There's a, a component of equity that we have to manage, and they would be distributed um, throughout the district based upon student population at each of the respective buildings. And, and that's why the eight isn't defining so much at, at uh, Madary or so much at Hillcrest or the high school, for example. Um, it, it's really going to be distributed accordingly to the student enrollment at each of the sites. Further, the notion is that these individuals would support and assist students that may have found themselves in a quarantine environment and coming back. Equally, it could be to support a student that has a 504 plan that needs some sort of remote instruction. Um, they would work under the direction of the building principal to address the needs that are most identified within that building campus. So um, there are, I had started, I believe there was some request to have some sort of a job description for each of these positions. I have started to develop a job description 
uh, that would detail all of these elements out. Um, again, it's very draft, and I could hand something out if, it, if it's of interest to the board, but um, that's what the role of these individuals would be, very targeted, specific interventions to support very targeted and specific academic needs of children. Oh, Dr. Will, I do have a question regarding that. So would the, would the intent be to hire a certified teacher? Yes. Okay. Yes. I thought, we were, okay, are we asking questions per line item? Because I was writing them down as we went. So I didn't know if we were, doing, sure it, can. Or if we're doing it at the end. Okay. If you want to wait till the end, too, that's fine. I, I guess it's, this is a discussion. This yep. is the discussion part of the meeting. My only question with those as well is that, um, and I don't know if we know this yet, and maybe the elementary or principals can speak to this, but is that where we're going to pull students out of their regular curriculum time and then have them meet with an interventionist because sometimes I just wonder if that's like a chicken and the egg sort of situation like okay now you miss technology okay now how do we catch you up there and it, to me I'm just a little nervous about how that would really help teachers um, and not then have to have them add extra work to catch up a classroom Kid. So I don't, I don't know what thoughts are on yeah, that. I don't know piece. if there's is any of the principals want to speak to that specifically, how you would envision that playing out in your building, or I guess I would see it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, how? Um, yeah. That really becomes the administrative function of yeah. how they manage that. So. Right. I just, I just want to make sure if we're going to invest, you know, what are we at here? Half a million dollars? Where am I? Sorry. Yeah, $1.6 million that we know, you know, w would it be more time in, you know, extended school year, extended, I don't want to do extended day, uh, but just those types of ideas, um, because I just, again, fear missing current classroom time is also missing current classroom time, so just... Correct. Something, and, to, something to think about, And I, I know there are certain structures, particularly, um, I'll say the high school or the middle school, where they have like SRB time, where those individuals could be utilized. And I think there's been ways that this has been, um, I wouldn't say necessarily piloted, but efforts to okay. provide supports like this at Camelot last year. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some, some experiences there. And I don't want to put Dr. Lean on the spot tonight because he wasn't prepared to answer any of those questions. Yep. Um, but there are ways that, that I believe our principals be very sensitive to what you're talking What's, okay. about. Okay, that sounds good to me. And this is marked, and I said yellow earlier, but I apologize, it's marked orange. And orange means we think it's a critical position or positions, and we'll be advertising for this as soon as possible. And, as and just, to, just to clarify that, when we say critical, all these are very important. We wouldn't have them on the table if they weren't. But we have contacted the South Dakota Department of Education and articulated these positions that are highlighted in orange and they have given already approval to proceed with the advertising and hiring of these positions. We wouldn't have to wait until possibly October, maybe even November or possibly even longer than that to go ahead and advertise for these positions because the state is requiring us to submit our plan by August 20th and then from there they have a, an approval process that they're going through. The unfortunate part of that is they have essentially every school district submitting a plan that's going through a person. So it's pretty limited on how quickly they can turn around their response. These we did get approval from the state already. And the reason is, is so hopefully, if we can get them all hired on the first day of school, these positions are in the buildings. Right. The communication manager, that is a position that will help uh, combine the district communication efforts to make it a district-wide communication, whether it's through the high school, middle school, et cetera, and they'll work with the social media outlets as well as our website and the newspaper and radio. Best practices coach, uh, that's a halftime position that would implement best practices in the district, the PBIS coach. Project-based interventions. I'm getting that down to positive-based intervention. I'm still getting it down. Positive behavior interventions. Behavior. <laughs> a, a month from now, I'll still have it wrong. Um, that's the support staff to implement our PBS district-wide, and it'll be on coaching staff and serving as primary point of contact. 
with the S South Dakota Department of Education. The school psychologist, that's also orange, a uh, position we'd also like to have in place when school starts. Um, that one's pretty much self-explanatory to help with students' mental health. Uh, the behavior intervention sources, those are supply items that staff may need for the PBIS and other behavior intervention supplies necessary that they may need. And the last one is Supplement Title I. Um, right now, at the end of the year, our Title I funding's a little short, and so we found out we could use uh, ESSER money for that as well. So for over the next few years, we would use ESSER I to supplement our Title I and then get it back in balance where the revenues equal expenditures in Title I. And as you contemplate questions you might have, I'd just like to reiterate some of the ways that we've gone about attempting to gather input and feedback um, this was published on the district web page, which was a requirement. We had uh, asked the superintendent a question as a means to gather input. Um, we have met uh, a couple of times with BEA leadership, um, particularly after the last meeting. We, we had some really good conversations about some of the, the things. You'll notice that there's some uh, language changes, some title changes, some function clarification in some of these roles. Um, and that was as a direct result of input from, from BEA. We have to remember BEA represents, a, I would say, approximately 200 employees in the school district, so certainly not all. So what we did as well administratively is pushed out this document to every K-12 email address um, of an employee in the school district and asked for direct feedback, um, emailing either myself or Brian or Laura um, I believe we had three, maybe four emails back in terms of responses. Um, so again, we've, we've tried a variety of different ways to elicit and solicit some input um, going forward and, and trying to ensure that we're putting forward the very best plan that we possibly can. And I, I think it's important to emphasize that operationally our goal is this. We know that these are short-term monies and we're trying to find ways to make long-term investments by utilizing these funds. And there are some districts that are choosing to utilize these funds for construction projects. And when you look back at the actual intent, going back to the slide share that I had from Secretary Sanderson, it's about how do we address students that are coming off of COVID or still navigating COVID and understanding that we have a number of implications for not only the academic success of our learners, but equally the social emotional aspect of our learners. And how do we address engagement as part of that as well? Um, and all those are factored into what you see before you. Also, we have to remember input is not an isolated event. It's something that happens regularly and often in our school district. Uh, we have surveyed staff historically um, we did not last year, but we have historically. Um, we also know that there's been ongoing meetings. I meet every month with BEA leadership. I meet every month with uh, teacher leaders from the BEA. And those are not meetings that are held in a vacuum. I'm taking note all the, all the way through. And while not everybody may agree with the plan that's presented um, after uh, quite literally a number of hours that were spent, we believe that this is a plan that represents both the intent of ESSER funding as well as the needs that have been identified in our students. Um, I don't have the full presentation, nor would it be appropriate for me to provide so tonight um, from the search survey, but I can tell you that there are some rather uh, staggering numbers when you start looking at what's happening with our student body, and it emphasizes how we can support our students academically as well as socially, emotionally, and that's what's reflected on our plan. For example, um, we have over 200 students that have identified, um, that are female students that have identified that they are experiencing a level of depression. That's up from 150 female students four years ago. We have um, not quite as steep of an increase, but still an increase among our, our males. And Consequently, you can imagine what that does to the reflection of, of personal esteem. Both those trends are going down. And I think that's reflected not only in what's happening within social media realms, Facebook, etc., 
but we also see that playing itself out in terms of academics and hope and how are we presenting hope academically as well as socially emotionally for our students. So what you see before you is an attempt to capture all of that into a meaningful and strategic way that will yield some benefit for our staff and for our students in years to come. And Dr. Willa, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe when Dr. Sanderson, or Tiffany San Secretary Sanderson gave her report, their priorities were learning loss and helping students to become up to speed in terms of the learning loss they might have experienced as a result of COVID, social, emotional, and mental health, and getting kids, helping those kids that need that cha those challenges, and then staff development. I, as I recall, those were the three that she said the state is putting an emphasis on. So I would assume that when they're looking at these expenditures, they're going to look to see if districts are addressing those things for sure. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't know how much time they'll spend with each of these plans, but. I would assume that because that's their priorities and they expressed that at the meeting last week, those are some things they're going to expect. I, w I would anticipate as much and, and again, I'm, I'm not going to cast any criticism one way or another. I think it's just an observation. There are some school districts that are utilizing these funds for construction projects. I've heard stories about tennis courts being built. I've heard stories about golf simulators being acquired. Um, there are quite a number of districts that are looking at HVAC projects, for example. We've focused on the human element of how we can make an impact, not only today, but like I said, going forward. And do I expect everybody to agree? Absolutely not. When you're talking this kind of money, um, sometimes it creates just as many challenges as if you don't have any resources. Um, so we're trying to do the very best that we can, again, with uh, with understanding that we have a number of, of needs academically as well as socially, emotionally. And to answer the question that people might have about why are we looking at adding eight positions, but yet at the high school we didn't renew or, or rehire four positions. Um, I think it's really important to understand that that's part of a, a longer perspective. Um, we understand that where our current student enrollment is, we had to make some changes if we were going to continue to focus on finding ways to be competitive with teacher compensation in our district. That was very, very important. A priority, if you recall, going back to last year when we had our salary study working with the BEA, and, and the pie is only so big. The pie is only so big, it's defined by the number of students that you have and then the number of staff that you have to serve those students, and so we we, we made some adjustments accordingly. And very clearly, these positions are not going to be continuing forward. And for example, those student success interventionists um, can be absorbed ultimately at the three, end of three years into our system quite easily, if indeed they're quality individuals. And that's because historically, we have any number of positions, eight, nine, 10, 12, through retirements or people getting married, moving to a different community, whatever the case might be. So there's going to be some flexibility there. Um, and that's where if, if, if I could, I'd invite Dr. Von Fisher forward just to talk about that a little bit from a high school perspective, because I think it lends some clarity. And, and one of the things that we heard today as we met with, with staff from the high school and some middle school staff about this is, we need to understand a little more the narrative of, of why the four positions and then the eight and what that means long term. And, and I think Dr. Von Fisher did a very nice job of highlighting that today. Now, the other thing I want to share before he begins his comments is um, we may owe Mari Von Fisher big time because it is Dr. Von Fisher's anniversary this evening. <laughs> that, was your, that was your excuse Saturday, Paul. What was it? What's the deal here? It, it, it was her birthday on Saturday. It's our anniversary today. If you look back uh, 24 years, that was also the day of my bachelor party on her birthday. So I will continue to owe her for a very, very long time. How, how, how likely is all that? Don't we, should we it's true. Look it up. I'll, uh, I'll send you some documentation. No, I probably won't. Um, so 
great conversation that we had earlier today. I, I think that is a real question that comes forward is, is there's, there's so much information coming so quickly. And I think that uh, Dr. Willard said it before drinking from a fire hose. And, and so much comes forward that, that if you listen at a, at a cadence that would be kind of maybe normal, um, you'll hear, oh, there's uh, positions being cut and now positions are being added but really not understanding where things, the ebb and the flow. And so we had that conversation and, and I think that um, it, was, it was helpful. Let's just speak a little more about the high school needs that we have. Even before COVID came, we had a number of students and, and an increasing number of students that are disengaged, truly disengaged. Um, there was a point in our meeting today where it was a small group of, 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 of teachers and, and administrators who knew each other and I threw out a name of a student that had struggled um, in, and, and um, you know who I'm talking about. And I threw it out and, and everyone said, oh yeah, that student really could benefit from having some people around who, if, you've, if you know Rita Erickson, she does an excellent job with her credit recovery program. And I think that we could, we could increase in, in some ways, I don't know what it would look like yet, but I think that with the staff on hand, to be flexible in a way that classroom teachers aren't able to be flexible with their time. We could really benefit students. And, and if every teacher is a counselor, when you look at it that way and not trained, but I think we all touch those lives. And that student that I mentioned today and many other students who are, who are hurting and struggling could really benefit from a one-on-one -on -one or small group time on a regular basis with teachers. And I think it would cover many of those areas that we're, we're looking at. And it's not, it is that, it was well said uh, earlier today and then again by Dr. Willard, um, a, a, it's a short-term expenditure for hopefully a long-term gain. We've, we've hit kind of a, there's a, a hitch in our giddy up right now with COVID and how it works with culture in the school. And, and we really need to work on that. And if we're not intentional, and, and this could be really helpful with that, a lot of these things could be, but especially those, those uh, the, the interventionists could be helpful in helping people remember why they're here. You know, what are we doing and, and how, are we, how are we working here? Um, another piece, even before we chose not to fill the positions by, um, held by our retirees this year, um, we have, we have, because of the students get to choose the classes, I always say, if, if we could tell the students which classes they're taking, we'd be fine every year. But we don't do it that way. We have a students choose, and rightfully so. We have pathways. We want them to, to uh, go down the paths that they choose for themselves. Um, but because of that, and because of staff certification at the high school, and maybe middle school levels as well, we run into problems with, with class balancing. And there are some classes that are a little low, and there are some classes that are a little high. Um, and I think that our, our staff is, is used to kind of looking over that fence and saying, hmm, well, not great, but I understand it. I, I get it. So what we're doing with these, with these uh, maybe uh, we were able to work it out in the math area. We were able to work it out um, in many areas, but that social studies area was one that we, I did have to come back and ask for some more help. We're, we couldn't quite do it. And so that, I think, speaks to you know, our, our drive to make it manageable um, for our staff and for our, uh, for our students. But even before that, we, were, um, we had that happening. And so if we did replace our staff, um, it would help maybe in those departments, but it's not a blanket help for everything. We, it's not an elementary, um, you know, in elementary, our teachers are certified to, you know, can spread the students out among the classes. It doesn't really work that way at the high school level. So it's kind of a different scheduling perspective. Um, and, and one more piece I'll throw out is we've been toying with that idea of an alternative program for a long time. And we've touched on it. And I think everyone here, we don't have to, don't have to sell that to any of you. I think we all see the need. And, and this would be one more piece that I think even short term would help us with that culture, with that, uh, with that alternative piece that we, are, that we really are missing. So thank you for listening. I'll answer any questions if you have them. So um, it's my anniversary too, by the way. <laughs> well, you better go. <laughs> Sorry, Barb. I, I think to the doghouse. <laughs> Is it really? Oh, anniversary. happy anniversary.
So again, a lot of information we, we shared with you, for... gave you some context. So yeah. Dr. One Murphy. of the questions that I know, I know at the high school when we had some of the AP classes were no longer available. But my, my question then is as some of the classes became larger, would these interventionists be able to help, let's say in a situation where there's a large class and as you could see that a student is struggling and falling behind, could that teacher then make a referral for that student to work with the interventionist as well? Because I, you know, I don't like the large class mm -hmm. thing and I'm, I'm concerned about that and I've had parents question me about that as well. Well, I, I think there's a, there's a couple of ways to look at that. We have, we have an SRB now, a uh, student responsibility block that happens twice a week. That would be the first level of intervention, I would think. Uh, we will definitely work on coming up with criteria for once we know exactly what we have and, and how, how that might fit, we will find uh, criteria and then target students who will, who, uh, will be offered interventions. And, and so yes, but we have some levels that we will go through before we get there. Other questions for Paul? Okay, thank you. So is this, is this a time that we're supposed to discuss it or is it when it's later on when for motion? <clears throat> motion is later when we take action. I know that. Well, so I'm asking, do you want comments from the board now or do you want comments later? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I think either is fine. They're both informational <coughs> items, so. Well, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to submit uh, a, a few items and a few thoughts. Uh, first of all, Paul, I couldn't agree with you more on the things that you're saying. And um, I'm scared to death by this. I'm sorry, that's an unfortunate expression uh, by this COVID situation. And I'm not sure it's over yet. And uh, that is why, um, as I was trying to frame my thoughts about what to do about this, and I, I kind of picked up pretty close to where you were, uh, Deb. And if you look back in that DOE report on uh, towards the end, uh, what does it say? Supporting strong instruction and educational opportunities. Number two, addressing students' social, emotional, and mental health needs. Number three, continuing to address issues of educator recruitment and retention. Well, to me, you know, as I'm trying to frame up my, 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 my concern about um, a good outcome, the best outcome we have, it's items number one and two, and what it represents is boots on the ground meaning people that we have. So I don't have any uh, question about some of the things you're talking about, Paul, as, as, a, as an example. And that is why I favor um, uh, discussion and I may or may not have any support at the board level uh, this evening, but that's why I favor discussion about absolutely implementing a whole bunch of the things that are listed there. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying throw them all out, but I say let's, given my concern about what may be coming down the road and the most important thing as repeated several times in our materials tonight is the outcome of the student, we need boots on the ground. So what I'm, what I'm proposing is that, um, that an alternative, albeit very quickly formulated, a uh, new uh, number of these things be accepted and put in the proposal so that they, and, um, you know, they, they get in there. But that we, as I understood it from the last meeting or two meetings ago, we can hold money in abeyance because at that point in time, if this thing has got another leg to it, if it's got another wrinkle to it, whatever the case may be, we may need that money desperately. And then we can recalibrate. I don't, you know, I don't particularly, um, agree with the theory that we put it all out there and then we can always change it around. Well, you know, it doesn't, you can't unpickle a pickle. It, it, you know, it's very often, it is very difficult to reroute things once they've been mapped out. So that is why I favor uh, absolutely supporting a, a, a significant number of the items that are listed here in the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, but holding back on others so that we can be responsible uh, uh, stewards of the money if we need it 
for, again, the principles or um, uh, requirements number one, strong student support and strong emotional psychological support. And frankly, um, um, the way I kind of cut up the list, it was um, without having previously uh, used it as a cheat sheet, uh, the, the BEA uh, um, uh, tendencies were pretty much in, in the way I want. <laughs> there were a couple exceptions, but they we definitely were uh, tilting in the direction I thought would, would be the best use of the funds right now. Other thoughts from the board? Well, I would um, agree with much of what you say, Van, and, and then if you're looking at resources, I would, I would take a look at some of the administrative positions and probably um, <coughs> move to defer some of that for, uh, for possible funding in year two or three of Esther three, so that we have some um, <coughs> backup resources uh, or meanwhile uh, put put those uh, resources in the classroom with a lot of long-term commitment if you look at the <clears throat> if you look at line 28 on our sheet we're talking about 3.2 million dollars of ongoing commitments and we have a 24 million dollar budget add a little special ed might be 25 26 million but still one out of eight dollars in our in approving this, we're going to be expanding about 10% of our budget with ongoing, um, admittedly ongoing uh, commitments. Now, I think uh, uh, we, Dr. Wood has thought this thing through, he probably has an explanation about some of these positions uh, that may, uh, may kind of fall off the wayside, but that's not what we know tonight in terms of the thing. I would, I would um, <clears throat> yield to more of the educational side, as Van said, the social, emotional, and other other uh, support systems that are in, and back away from some of the administrative things. I think number 20, 21, 22 are in in that pot, that that group of um, <clears throat> that are administrative, and just kind of keep our our um, plan and. And if we say, okay, and we aren't going to use those funds in 21 or t fiscal 22, we're going to defer to 23 or 24 for uh, direct intervention or whatever it is. Um, then I also uh, want to ask a question uh, that if I do the arithmetic right, this would mean that with the eight persons in that intervention, that likely Hillcrest and Madeira would not have one OFT assigned to them they'd get a fraction of that because they don't have enough students relative to the 3,000 uh, to be one eighth. Is that correct? We have 3,000 students, 34, 30, whatever it is, uh, they would have to share, they would not be at 1.0. And, and what could we do? Maybe add into the 8.0 or, or whatever, so they would have at least a one, one person O uh, intervention specialists that they could count on in those two schools. Otherwise, other schools will have a 1.0 or more um, positions, and they will not even have one point. Just, just as on a, enrollment and the equity thing that uh, you mentioned in terms of. And and that was discussed, and and I think it's important to reference that Hillcrest and Madera are the two schools with the highest number of. Title I or related staff already. Um, when you look at um, reading interventionists, for example, and Title I staff members, they have a higher ratio, if you will, than, than other schools just because of school-wide identified needs. So I think it's important to lace that through that conversation too. The point is that the resources are there already? I'm saying that they have intervention supports that other schools don't have. In some in 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 relationship because of what we're confined to do with Title One funds. Wes, were you? Just, can then, I I'll, then I'll conclude by saying that you know, in two years from now, we 
we're going to have a commitment here, of ongoing commitment of, even if you take out the eight interventionists and you subtract them out, you're still going to have uh, uh, $1.5 million of ongoing commitments without, and, uh, and you know budget cuts are tough. We did it this year. And there's um, public perception that why my, why, why my program, why my support system. So that is really a big concern, I think, to this board, is what we're, what we're investing in ongoing, um, continuing, that we, won't, we, uh, we even admin, identify in line 28, the green, light green, is ongoing. And, I, and, and I'm kind of troubled by that because I know that having worked with federal funds, you just get to the point and you just have to make a decision. And we will be making, this board collectively call we, we'll be making this decision probably within two years where we're going to be having to strategy, uh, uh, develop a strategy to either com continue with whatever resource we can find. And of course, the only option, only resource, new resource other than new students is an opt-out. And you know what happened to the last opt-out, so. And I do think that's an important consideration because I know already with the hiring of the social worker, Everyone is very happy with having that social worker and the job that the, that's being done by the social worker, what it's contributed in helping staff and students. So you can't two years from now say, well, we're going to yank that. We're not going to have that anymore. A lot of people are going to be wanting that and really pressuring the board to move forward with continuation of hiring that. So it is a consideration as we look at all of these new hires. Um, granted, as Dr. Willard, I think, said, you know, there could be staff openings where some of these interventionists could move in if they've done a good job. Maybe there would be a teaching position available that they would qualify for and they could be hired in that sense. But things like the mental health counselors, the social workers, the um, school psychologist, those are things that are people are going to come to really appreciate, I think. And then where do we find the funds for that? Add the second curriculum director in there, yeah. the officer in there too. I think the one that I've gotten the most um, questions about is the communications manager, number 20. And I know when we had Dr. Holbeck here last year, he, he shared with us that that would be something our district should be consider. And he gave us um, some of these things that he said here would really benefit your, your district because there's so much out there that you can't keep on top of all of it. And I know one of the things I communicate a little bit to Dr. Willard that I think it's more than a communications manager. I think it's a community uh, liaison, someone that's working with our community, getting them involved more. One of the sessions I went to at the Associated School Board was how do you get parents engaged? Um, how do you get them involved more? In the, and how do we get our community involved more? So I do think there's, there's ways that we could utilize that position more than just communication manager, that it would, that it would encompass um, more more strategies for engaging the community members and um, and maybe businesses in our community that kind of thing as well. However, again, if it's something that people come to really appreciate, then how do we continue that? But that's one I think I've gotten a lot of feedback on that I think we need to either clarify it or expand the role of whatever we look at for that position. Um, a couple of thoughts. I agree a lot with Van what you're saying about boots on the ground and helping students as much as we can. And, and Wes, you shared that as well. Um, and I like a lot of these ideas. I know there's been a lot of time put into that. So thank you all for doing that. Um, on the communications uh, manager, I like that Deb community, maybe a community engagement coordinator, communications manager. Um, when I read through a lot of the BEA feedback from the teachers, um, there was a lot of feedback on that position. And um, during my teaching time, I probably would have felt the same way. Um, as I've um, been in different roles in the community, I, I think um, we're really lacking that uh, presence uh, out there in our community and, and sharing some of the things that are, are happening in our schools. And I think it's a way that we can also increase uh, enrollment. Um, I also think our uh, school uh, administrators and secretaries are um, 
sort of strapped with that communication and if there was someone in a professional role that could help them with that outreach and building community. I know when I get emails from the school, um, that, that really welcoming tone and the ideas and, and building community isn't maybe a focus, it's really informational um, and it, it really isn't building community um, within our schools. And so I see that position being able to build community, build consensus, uh, open up communication, open up ideas, support teachers in some of their communications that they need to do to families. So I do really uh, strongly support that role and, and many of the roles on here. And Wes, yes, I have all your concerns that, okay, now what are we gonna do uh, in two or three years when we have these things that have um, been working. But I also know that we will be really reflective as we go and we can look at these things as we spend out a year. Um, Brian, you shared that we can can re, can change things. Um, so I don't know. I, I like the plan. I think we're in a good good space. Well, just uh, uh, to, to provide a, a different perspective to what you're saying, Kelly, you know, um, um, Aside from the fact that at least two weeks ago, and it could have changed by now, the, the BEA put that as a very low uh, priority item. Uh, I think it's very low. I, I, I think it's very low I, also. When you're in business, that's what you do, public relations. When you're in business, that's what you do, communicate with your uh, customer. That's what uh, that's what the university does when 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 the deans and the everybody else go out. It is it is all about communication. And lo and behold, even worse, if something bad happens, that is exactly when you need to have communications, and it has to come from the 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 right and the reasonable people. I don't think that having a communications director is uh, likely to be a um, magic pill for this issue. What's really going to happen is that, that that every single person that's a member of this district, um, starting with the school board, are, are proponents and, and ready to step up at all times in an appropriate way as to what is going on. So, you know, that's, that's why, um, you know, I, I honestly didn't get too fired up about it uh, and uh, uh, maybe more fired up about it right now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just, you know, I just, I just, uh, it's, a, it, it's an area where I would uh, choose to um, respectfully take a different path. I, I remember our training when um, Mr. Holbeck was here and he reiterated a story at the ASBSD convention, which really hits home for me. And it was the black van story. So I won't do it justice and he'll have to forgive me for any errors, but essentially a black van is driving around potentially kidnapping children. And so on social media, Everybody puts out the alert because we care about kids and our families. And we want everyone to be safe. So they put out this alert and everyone's all worried about the black van and they got their binoculars out and we have the, all the families out looking and searching um, because our kids are in danger. And there's all this fear and discord and uh, all of this swirling around. Should we even live here? Is this a safe place to be? One thing leads to another. Well, they investigated it the same day they found out it was someone who lived in that neighborhood. He was driving home from work. He had a black van. So at the time, I think he was a superintendent. He communicated out, hey folks, all clear. It was just someone who lived in the neighborhood. There's no threat. And he went to sleep thinking, done. But what he says is, if it's on social media twice, it's fact. And so it kept spreading. And I think it was months and months and months people were still afraid of the black van. It just hurts my soul. I've had enough um, parent meetings, family meetings now, with parents in tears about something that wasn't even happening. Fear and concern that we were changing things that we've never even talked about. Somehow, this 
sowing of discord happens and we don't have the bandwidth to put our arms around it to let our families know it's okay. These are the facts, this is the truth. So when I first thought about a PR thing, I wasn't too excited about it when it was worded as PR. But if we're talking about somebody who can get out there and get to our families and explain to them, no, you don't have to be worried and this is why, or this is the actual decision, come talk to us, or even just to engage them back into the conversation with us. That has true value for our families, um, just to remove that fear and anxiety, which is just another level they do not need right now. So I would also support that role. I would support the plan as it's laid out. I think it's clear and transparent and it hits, it hits the objectives of what the SR3 is for. Um, so I would ask, the board what um, additional discussion needs to happen because I know that we have uh, maybe some desire to talk about pulling a couple of items. We'll have to get to a place of more specifics on that um, before we get our voting on anything so that the board kind of knows where we're at. Well, you're uh, correct in anticipating that I'll be voting against it. Um, and so between that and just simply uh, if the board will do as it wishes. Um, the only other thing I could say is, you know, we, uh, we could be here until sunup talking about each one of these line items. Um, so I would, I would think to be uh, more efficient to um, remand it to somebody to, uh, if there is any appetite, to look for any cuts, and uh, and proceed that way with with uh, with with a follow up. Um, uh, of the appropriate uh, board action on a special meeting basis or emergency basis or something like that. You know, otherwise, you know, it, it, all it is is it's here. Either you vote yes or no. And so I, I'm telling I'm telling you what I'm what my position is and and uh, I certainly respect the uh, four of you. We can go ahead and move forward and we can address that um, down in the action item or is there additional discussion we want to have? But if there's any other thoughts now before that, I don't want to cut anyone off. Okay. Thank you. Good discussion. Moving on. All right, friends, we're back into policy land. The first few we're going to be reading, these are second readings. Um, so we'll go through these rather quickly. JEAA, which is Learner Alternative Instruction. You'll note that there are not a lot of changes on there. Um, I have had some questions from individuals in the community about why, why we're, we are replacing students and learners and pupils. And you will see that through all the policies as we're trying to get toward a place of consistency and just using one term across our entire policy handbook. Next up, JEB, entrance age. You'll see there are not any significant changes to this policy, as I'm sure you've already read. Next up, JEC, school admissions. Have thoughts, please jump in there. Um, we've added a number of legal references as well as, as the term school district residency. Next policy, JECA, admission of resident learners. You will see that on the advice of the SBSD, the children and military personnel section was added in and there were a couple of additional changes there as well. Policy, JECAA, this is um, a recommendation that we delete the current policy language and adopt the sample policy from the ASBSD. They also recommended we change the policy title to learners enrolling from alternate instruction and unaccredited schools. Well, the, an unaccredited school could be a parochial school that is not accredited, right? Yes, we've had that search. For example, um, there could be a school that is starting new, 
that is declared a parochial that has not completed the accreditation process. So in the interim, they're considered non-accredited before they become accredited. Moving on, JECAC, the ASBD has recommended that we adopt their sample policy on transferring from an accredited school. So you'll see it's all in red and that's indicating the entire thing is new. Second reading, JECB, recommending that we rename this policy open enrollment and delete the current policy language and add the suggested new language. Right, so that's all the second readings. We're gonna be moving on to the notification of review. These are the first times we're letting, uh, first time we're letting you know that we're reviewing the following policies. <clears throat> notification of review for JCBE vacation holidays for employees. Yeah, um, and this policy was added in a little bit out of turn because the um, board members would like to add Juneteenth into the list of holidays. So just a note on that policy uh, being reviewed right away. Um, next one, JCBE vacation holidays for employees. Oops, sorry, that did not move forward. Is everybody on? Okay, thank you. Sorry, I had to sync the meeting quick. Next up, JBEC drug-free workplace contains new language related to school employees and medical cannabis and a definition of illegal drugs. I had no idea how much time we would be spending talking about medical cannabis this year, but here we are. So. And that kind of came from, I mean, the state is giving you direction on how to write that policy, correct? That's I'll just comment real briefly because this is a, a pretty hot topic yeah. right now, as you can imagine. and. Um, the model policy has been shared with all school districts across the state to reflect uh, the rules that are being meted out and sorted out right now and we must have a policy in place that's why this one has been put in place where it has prior to the issuance of cards and they anticipate that card issuing will begin sometime in October November so um, we're in pretty good cadence to be have a policy in place prior to that time Next up, JFCH, alcohol and other drug use by students. Just expanding the language related to drugs in school. Next up, JHCD, administering medicines to students. Clarifying that a separate policy governs administration of medical cam cannabis. So that clarification will be in there and then contain, it'll contain updated language regarding um, prescription medication labels. Um, the ASBSD is also recommending that we adopt their consent form, which is JHCD-E1. Apologize, it's acting a little bit. Doctor, well, I want the medical cannabis one though. I wanted the policy will state that there will not be medical cannabis in the school. The person who's administering it brings it to the school, correct? Correct. So that, there won't be storage anywhere. That's been the discussion of the yeah. policy committee that we won't have the the responsibility to store or to disseminate. That it would be a, an approved provider that would, and that's all designated through the card process and everything. Um, managing that process. I just think that's important for people to be aware of. Very important and I, I know one of the concerns is that this is a recognized um, recognized medicine in South Dakota but it's not necessarily at the federal level and and we don't want to in any way jeopardize federal funding so again we're very cautious about that. 
It might be helpful at our um, next reading to go through that with a little bit more detail so that because um, they also shared like it can't be smoking or vaping. There's a different form that it has to be. And I think it would be great for parents and community members to be aware of that. Absolutely. Good point. Thank you, Deb. And just real quick, I have been in communication with our legal counsel and they'd be prepared to come and speak to that as well with the board. Perfect. I think that would be well worth pursuing. All right, JECBA foreign exchange students. There's no recommended changes by the ASB um, SD at this time. The policy committee will, will review. Next, JECC student assignment and attendance area will also be under review. Okay, next up, the superintendent will give an update on COVID-19 items. Well, if it pleases the board, I think I'll defer any comments on either 7.26 or 7.27. I tried to address um, some of the COVID items in my superintendent report, and then we did hear our facility uh, progress thus far um, from ARC Inc. earlier this evening. Right. Looks like that sounds good to the board. We're going to skip ahead then to the consent agenda. I need a motion for approval of the consent agenda. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. That moves. Van seconds. Um, Clint, on the on the um, opt out thing, there was a reference at 36. Is that the reference to the people that are um, the 34 in, 36 out? Is that what the, is? Uh, intended to Amanda can you give a little clarification on the enrollment open enrollment in versus out on on that that's not holistically that's just what we've received this far but it's not a comprehensive district wide where we're at we, that's that's a much bigger report that we have to solicit from the state sorry what is the 36 that was in the board packet this school year, for this school year, new notifications. And as far as the aggregate open roll in versus out, um, that's a report that we have to generate specifically from the state, which we'll do after, we have some historical reports, but we would do that after the count date, the official count date is completed. Other discussion? Call the question. Motion passes. All right, I need a motion for approval of the 2021-2022 custodial agreement. Second. Second that. West motion, Kelly second. Any discussion? I'd like just to I'll give a brief brief update <clears throat> just so you know the changes when we met with the custodial group uh, 2.4 percent increase in their hourly wages uh, and also added Juneteenth as a holiday uh, which will be consistent with the upcoming policy change to vacation and holidays and we also agreed to do a salary study to look at their salary or hourly wages as they compare to other comparable positions in the Brookings area and that's to be slated to be done by next spring Questions? 
Other question? Motion passes. Step, I need a motion for approval of the 2021-2022 annual salary listing. I so move. Second. Deb moves, Van seconds. Any discussion? Motion passes. Next up, I need a motion for approval of the 2021-2022 board subcommittees. Move. Second. Moved by hands. You were going to want to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> Seconded by Kelly. Um, so I, I, the committees on here represent uh, the best of our ability to align people with their desires. Um, very excited about uh, um, Deb and Van will be on our performance oversight committee. Kelly and Wes will be sitting on our facilities and construction committee. Myself and Deb will be on the policy and governance committee. No tears. Um, and then Van has stepped up for an additional role, which is um, getting off the policy committee will allow him the time to put his expertise towards this. And that will be the Human Rights Committee. So thank you, Van. For but I will be taking my policy booklet with me. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for stepping up and representing the board on that committee. Kelly and Melissa will be on the Intergovernmental Relations Committee. Deb on the Mental Health Coalition. Van and Wes will continue with school finance with their objective being around um, financing our construction efforts. And then the whole um, committee whole board acts as a committee for negotiations. Any questions about the committees as they've been laid out? All right, call the question. Motion passes. Next up, I am looking for a motion of approval for the 2021-2022 budget and levies. Second? I second that. Okay, moved by Wes, seconded by Deb. Any additional discussion? Brian, did you have anything you wanted? Recap then, what the board's approving is this budget that was presented tonight on the blue sheet, as well as what I uploaded for the tax levy request that'll be sent to the county auditors at Moody and Brookings. Questions for Brian? All right, call the question. Motion passes. Up, need a motion of approval of Dubrook School District to pick up drop off students in Aurora, the corner of Pine and Oak. Move. Second. By Van, second by Kelly. Any discussion? <laughs> Call the question. I feel like everyone's getting a little competitive about motioning and seconding up here, so. Hey, get in there, Deb. I believe in you. <laughs> Next up, I'm looking for a motion of approval of revisions made to policy JEAA student alternative instruction homeschool. I move acceptance. Can second. Moved by Deb, seconded by Kelly. Um, any additional discussion around this policy? Right. Thank you, Brian. You're just fine. That's okay. You're just reading my mind. Motion passes. Looking for approval of revisions made to policy JEB entrance age. Move. I'll second. Okay, moved by Van, seconded by Wes. Any discussion? Call the question. <coughs> Doesn't it feel good to update policy? Feeds the soul, right? 
I know I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. It's like when you clean out your closet. Oh, motion passes. Next up, looking for approval of revisions being made to policy JEC school admissions. I so move. Second. Moved by Deb, second by Kelly. Any discussion? All the question. Motion passes. Next up, motion of approval of revisions made to policy JECA, admission of resident students. Move. Second. Moved by Van, seconded by Wes. Any additional discussion? Call the question. Motion passes. Next up, a motion of approval of revisions made to policy JECAA, admission of new residents and students from unaccredited schools. I so move. Second. Deb moves, Van seconds. Any discussion? All the question. Motion passes. Next up, uh, approval of a new policy JECAC transfer from an accredited school. Move. Second. Moved by Kelly, second by Deb. Any discussion? Call the question. Motion passes. Mm -hmm. I need a motion for approval of revisions made to policy JECB, admission of non resident students. I move approval. Second. By Deb, second by Kelly. Any discussion? Call the question. Motion passes. All right, I now need a motion to remove from table the elementary and secondary school emergency relief proposed budget and expenditure plan. Just removing it from the table. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. And a second? Second that. Okay, moved by Wes, seconded by Kelly. Oh, call the question. We're waiting on me this time. Motion passes. Okay, that brings us to the item then. Um, looking for a motion of approval of the elementary and secondary school emergency relief proposed budget and expenditure plan. Motion and a second for discussion. I can make a motion for approval. I will second. Moved by Kelly, seconded by Melissa. This is the time for discussion. Well, I re remain concerned about the administration. When I add up, I find an easy quarter million dollars. It's just administration. And I just think we need to uh, we th we think that. And, and uh, I asked at the last meeting for job descriptions, and there are job descriptions that might make me feel a little better. I think Kelly made a nice, uh, good argument, good, good statements relative to 
to communications manager, but on the other hand, um, uh, we have um, other priorities. Our priorities are to put resources in the, into the classroom and to support. That's what the ESSER fund came from, was from the um, federal government viewing students having learning losses, whatever else. And so I think that's a little bit outside the box of what the intent is, but um, <clears throat> um, I suspect this will, would get approved by the state, but if it doesn't, it doesn't. So I do, uh, I, I continue to object to 2021 and 22. And so I would amend the motion, um, I'll have an amendment to the motion following any other discussion that you would have. Uh, so I'll defer that now for the discussion and then we'll, we'll uh, I'd like to have you return my motion. Wes, Amendment. Could, um, could you tell me the lines again? 21 and 22. 20, 20, 20, 21 and 22. I would support 21 and 22 coming out of the plan. <clears throat> we, if we want to discuss that. And Wes, you intrigued me with that. Will Hillcrest and Madary get a half person and do we have, do we need nine? Is that what you were saying when you were saying that? I don't know the arithmetic, but uh, Dr. Willard, if, if you have to have the title funds evenly distributed or the services easily, evenly distributed. So if Madari and Hillcrest are getting those services, then this school is getting an equal amount of services. So I'm still thinking that we would be nice to have one OFTE and if it's an extra fraction, great in those two schools um, because um, the eight doesn't turn out quite right arithmetically. And I don't know if it's 8.6 or whatever it is, but somehow or another, I'd like to see that those schools can depend on one person there um, without having to split their time. So, with them. so real quick, I'll have to do a little math and that's why I'm looking over at Brian. If we establish, because it's based on equity, a, a formula of equity, and um, I would say that that's something that we had done with Title I, just to give you a, a context. Um, we had concerns in this building, Dakota Prairie, about having uh, no Title I services because there were no Title I funds because it wasn't a designated Title I school. So in order to put somebody in place, we hired a a 0.5 title, 0.5 interventionist. Well, then because of equity requirements at the federal level, we had to equally hire reading interventionists in addition to Title I, and these are general funded interventionists at both Hillcrest and Madary. We would apply a similar approach or formula here. So if we establish our basis, if you will, of of Hillcrest at, and I'd have to pull up the number student enrollment real quick, um, and Brian and Laura, maybe you have that in front of you. Um, as, as the basis, 305, as the basis, then equally, not equally, in an equitable fashion, we would have to utilize that as the foundational factor to multiply up for building enrollment and reflect that in the number of staff that we would hire in that, in that role if that makes sense. So if, if so, if we have 600 at another school, they would get two FTE if 300 is our basis because of maintenance of equity. Am I, am I misstating that, Brian, as you understand it? Sorry. I know you're both working feverishly with the uh, math there, but. Keep it an equal percent, we'd almost need 11. For, an, for equity, correct? Equity wise, yes. So we'd have to have 11 FTE for equity. To get a 1.0 at, at You get Hillcrest. a 1.0 at Hillcrest. Because I took three, oh, 305 students divided by 3348, which was our last year's enrollment. So what is it? I know we could find the three FTE. Good smile. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, uh, Melissa, okay. my, just to be clear, to the board and to I, everybody present, I, my position has not changed. I would prefer that the board 
uh, choose to pass on this uh, motion and pass, meaning decline it, so that there can be some immediate uh, discussion about certain line items uh, in the next 24, 48 hours, so it can be done in a timely fashion. Typically, things don't work out well when people are horse trading at night uh, trying to figure this out. <laughs> you know, I mean, when we're trying to figure this out on the fly. And uh, the, the, the morning uh, brings a, a, a perhaps a better solution. So that's my position. I don't know if um, anybody else agrees. I would agree with that. I would like more information about number 22 because I know that our, our a lot of our staff and principals attended um, the PBIS training, and I'd like to know more about what that person would do. So that'd be something I would like to find out be, about more about before I would say, let's cut that. And then I think also that communications manager, if you could rework that um, to more of a community um, engagement type of position, and maybe it doesn't have to be full time, maybe it could be half time. Um, but those are the two items I know that I would like more information regarding. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, I'd like to vote for this, but I just have some, uh, I'm probably going to eat these words, but some heartburn over several of these, particularly as, as I view the world, they aren't going to go away. I don't care how hard we try. They're just simply uh, going to get embedded into our service structure, and it's going to be very difficult for this board and, and the leadership to back away from them. So, with that, I, I don't know how to, how to proceed without uh, this board dividing itself and, and having a 2-3 two, two, vote and a 3-2 vote and all this and that when, when I think um, Van probably has a good idea. Just, well, just take a look at this and come back with something that as you read the, the pulse of, our, of the board relative to some of these that are, that are administrative um, in nature. Uh, without having a divided board on something that's important, uh, a three million dollar package on the Esther three is no small hunk of change. I'd like I'd like to vote for this, but I have a little, as I quote myself again, heartburn, and and I think uh, we could do this in a conference call vote or something like that, or whatever it is, or voice face to face, whatever it is. But we have about a, we have a have all this week and probably till about what Tuesday of next week, Wednesday. The 20th, because uh, you have to be able to submit your report to the board. <laughs> I think we have a little less time than that. I, I looked um, at Brian, and Brian, I don't know if you want to speak, because it's, it's not just simply turning in this document. I understand to the state. that. I there's a, there's I, a narrative I, I, I that goes with it. That. So I understand that. That's I, why I gave you two days. I, I, want to be, I want to be clear, and you have to understand, too, that next week is our, our workshop week. So, I, I mean, time is tight. Well, you got this Friday. You, you can work on it, and the following Friday you can work on it. It, yeah, right. just so the board, it's a very, it's, there's two documents just for ESSER 3. One's a huge Word document that we have to do that first, and then we have to upload it onto another, this grants management site. I have utmost confidence that you can get it I, done. I, I, yeah. It's, it's, yes, okay. Would, would you, I'm, I'm fine to wait and go later this week. But I just wanted to sort of publicly state that I think the heartburn comes from we just really want to make the right decision, all of us together, and do the right thing. And it's really hard to know what to do that's going to help our students the most. And it's like if I knew one intervention was going to help with everything everybody needed, we would say, let's do that. Yeah. But, and it's hard to study and reflect and know exactly what the right move with the money is. So I think uh, just so everyone knows, I know we all collectively feel a strong responsibility and we want to do the right thing and we want to do the right thing for our students and our teachers. So I'm fine to wait and think through it um, as well. I'm fine to, th w to wait as well, but I do think we need some maybe additional information on a couple of items. One of them for me would be the PBIS coaching coordinator. I know there's a brief description there, but I would like to hear from the staff and the administrators um, how important that is to them in terms of their uh, support for this package so that's one I would like more information on and if the principals and 
superintendent think increasing line item 19 would give us a good use of funds too i mean i think that's something i would want to know too if, if you guys think that's going to help and work um because we have eight people there and you you need more there i think we look at that um so i think we need to talk logistics a little bit do so what's our drop dead that Brian still has an opportunity? I'm not sure giving him two days is fair, but um, if our drop dead is Thursday, then we have to somehow get um, staff and resources and whoever together in the next few days to get more information. And then we would need to have a special meeting and we need to do that so many days in advance. So I'm just logistically, I, we need to really think through that or we're gonna, we don't wanna risk losing our funding. And we um, have to consider our administrators too because April, or August 18th, the new teachers start with the, their training in that day or with their, so that, that's coming up next week too, so. On, on a personal level, I'll say that I do have some planned days off this week that were planned well in advance, um, but I can, I can find a way to navigate that if it's a phone-in option. Um, so I, I can work through that if need be. Brian, I believe you had something that you might want to comment on. Um, I think you need to just share um, from the state perspective what it is that you have to navigate and, and understand how, how this will function for you on administering it through the grants management process. Um, and and the, I should add that I think Van brought up, not all of this needs to be approved at one shot or one time. It could be some now, some next month, some next year. I mean, so there's options out there as well. I'm just a little hesitant because we have payroll coming up. I have an annual report coming up. I'm, I, and Wes, you're correct. I will get it done no matter what. I'm a team player, but it's, it's kind of tight. So I'm, this week if, would be better. If you're going to do a board meeting next week is not a good week because we have staff coming back. Right, there'll be people coming in our office. We'll be out at buildings. So are you saying we could approve this entire plan except lines 20, 21, 22 and come back and approve those later? You could approve whatever you want because the, the state said as long as we submit something, we can always amend it. You can have a set aside. You could have 50,000 set aside. You could have 500,000 set aside there. They just, we just need to submit something now knowing it can be amended next week, next month, next year. It's, it's, it's a I, um, flowing document. Kelly, I didn't, I didn't participate in the line discussion. I'm not sure that I'm uh, fully comfortable with whatever those one or two lines that you're talking about. I, um, again, I don't mean to, it, it may get approved tonight. I, I, that's, I'm fine with that too. I'm not fine with it, but I mean, I live with it. I would add that I'm not hung up on the eight versus the 11. I just thought it was fair to bring it up. And if there's practical reasons why it, it's, it, it's kind of a equation thing because when you ratchet it up by to nine, it affects everything. I understand, understand the inner, inner, inner um, calculations or not fully, but so there's a mathematical term for that. I'm having trouble remembering it. But so I'm I'm not hung up on eight versus eleven. But I just think it's fair to to recognize that that Hillcrest and Madera aren't going to have one point OFT. That's just the way it's going to be. And I should add, there's a chance we can't find eight staff either. So I mean, it could end up being four. Could end up being six. We don't know. We're hoping for eight or whatever's approved. But <clears> it could be such we don't. Get that many and and I, I think it's important to suggest, um, given what I've heard, that I would ask other principals to be present um, when this conversation is happening because um, this plan was was not built by Brian and I and Laura in the back room of the district office. It was there were hours spent on building what you see in front of you, taking into account all those factors that that I've articulated and shared and and I. I think you can ask any one of the principals or assistant principals and they would agree that, that there was a, a tremendous amount of care and thought put into this. And, and um, you've heard me use the term before, I don't like sausage making. 
I think we want to be intentional about what we're doing, and that's what we tried to be. So what I'm hearing is the need for more clarity, more clarification. Um, I think it has to be a discussion of the full board. I think that's where the most value is going to come so that there's a collective and shared understanding and perspective. Um, so I think what I'm hearing is we just have to get to a, a point where, and I don't think we're going to do it right now, but it sounds like we may be tabling this again and then calling everybody together to get to a final resolution. Um, I'm still struggling to understand what that resolution is because I hear a lot of different things of what I support and what I don't support. Um, and what, what comes back may not change at all. It may be this, this is what we really believe and recommend to be our best plan. And, and I, I completely understand and appreciate what you said, Wes, in terms of trying to get a plan that, that is, is shared collectively and everybody can agree upon. And as I said at the, at the onset of the meeting tonight, when you have resources, sometimes it's just as challenging as when you don't because not everybody's going to agree. And that's just the reality, and I understand that. So I'll, I'll do my part to try and, and find a way to do that. Um, but I, I guess I would, I would appreciate a little more understanding and clarity if it's – because when I hear the term administration, to me that sounds like we're taking away um, – Potentially, the, because some have viewed the social worker as a quasi-administrator, but I don't think that's the intent. So I'm just stating this out loud for clarity. Um, because the social worker doesn't provide direct services in the classroom, but it's still a very value-added position. And I know all of our principals have shared with me, Clint, I can't imagine, to your point, Wes, of not having that position. Um, I, I think the, the um, mental health counselors, I know Counselors sometimes are viewed as quasi-administration, but I don't think we want to remove that. I, what I'm hearing is maybe the curriculum support. Um, the the K-5 curriculum person is, is under question. Um, I'm hearing that the communications component may be under question. The best practices coach and coordinator, that, that title came directly from our colloquium work, understanding that we have a, an interest in in working through research-based best practices across every classroom in the school and helping and supporting and coaching teachers accordingly. Again, that speaks directly to the not only the recruitment but also retention of, of teachers. Um, the PBIS coaching coordinator came as some feedback from the idea that we want support to help coordinate efforts district-wide, going back to that conversation we had years ago about not being a, a system of schools but rather a school system. But that would be under question. I haven't heard any questions raised about the school psychologist. And then if we're going to question the, the PBIS coach and coordinator, I'm hearing maybe there's a question about the PBIS resources as well because those things might interface with each other. I haven't heard any questions about the Title I support. So to me, what I'm circling or earmarking is number 24, unless I hear otherwise, 22, 21, 20, um, <laughs> no, there were some questions early on about the bus cameras. I haven't heard any of those today. Um, and what I'm seeing is 15 as another one. Um, was there anything else that is number nine because it ties in with 15? Well, here we, here we go, uh, Clint. We're going to spend all night talking about this so, stuff. No, um, I, I don't want to talk about it, Van. I just want a little clarity so I know what ones are on the table. Right, let me, let, me, give you, let yep. me give you my list, and then, yep. you can, then you can go from there. Number five, number eight, number 14, number 17, number 20, number 21, number 22. And really, in order for us to get more information, we really have to say what we're concerned about. If we don't do yeah. that, they won't be able to provide it for us. Excuse me, unless I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, you know, and 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 I'm not saying I'm right in every one of them. Those are the ones I have questions about, and and uh, and uh, to me, it goes back to Kelly. You know, she said we want what's best for the students, and for me, what's best for the student is boots on the ground things that are right in or near the classroom that are going to help us through this terrible time. And that's what I want to make sure of. And in case we're wrong today, 
I want to be sure that we have some more uh, ammunition to try to take it another time. You know, whether we need another uh, uh, another social worker, we need another this, we need another that. You know, we're ready to go right at it. That's my thought. I also appreciate the flexibility that we'll have to be able to amend it because, like like Ben is saying, this will change. And we will find out after one semester what is working really well as definitely after one year and this is going out to 24. Um, so they afford us the right to learn and to adjust and I appreciate that opportunity because it does mean that we can learn from how this first year goes and make amendments and, and changes accordingly. So we've got that going for us. So, oh Deb, did you have something? No, so I just had one more question about so on the are you worried about the hiring and adver I know we're worried about the hiring and advertising of those line items and so on those dark orange that you already have approval for it, could we get you going on those tonight with the board and, and I'd be willing to vote for feel those, that yeah. so like um, yeah. so I guess we're saying 13 16 19 23 that we would approve tonight and then like you said van strategically work through the others did i miss one unless there needs to be some adjustment to 19 but we, we could always add though likely do that at the next approval is that correct so if we approve uh, line 19, which is 8 FTE, and we find out later we want to be able to get this equity piece. Then at the next time when we approve all the other items, we can just adjust that. Oh, heavens, yeah. Yes. Yep. So would we have a motion um, to approve those numbers that um, you enumerated? And, uh, you know, it's kind of piecemeal, but I'm, I, 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 we need to move forward, too. So, it's, uh, you know. And I'm willing to, I'm willing to yeah. find just the majority, except that I do feel like I um, have to be cautious. So right now we're looking at anything that has that orange box to the left of it. I would, I, I think you said um, 13 too, right? Yep. Yes. All the dark orange. I, I said is off to the left. I would, t I would take a risk on 13 yeah. if I move, move forward. 13. Um, 16, 16, 19, 19, 23. And we just say we have immediate approval. So to clarify again, because not everybody may see the document in front of them. So 19 would be the district social worker. 16 would be the district mental health counselor, which is two FTEs. 19 is district student success interventionists, which are eight FTEs. And 23 is a district school psychologist, which is a 1.0 FTE. Where's 13 at? Net on. District, yeah, I, I mentioned district that earlier. Again, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll restate 13 district social worker, 16 district mental health counselors, 2.0, the social workers of 1.0 FTE. The district student success interventionist, eight, eight FTE, and district school psychologist, one FTE. So then, um, if you would um, try to get this off dead center, Madam Chair, we could have a motion on these, act on them, as a, and amend the, amend the original motion to include these. And then I think we are, should be prepared to approve the ESSER II, because that's probably more of a done deal get those get that done and uh, so when you're ready for a motion I think any one of us can make the motion uh, on on the four that he just enumerated and then a separate motion on Esther two. Ellie was gonna just to make a friendly amendment to her motion along to state that those in orange and then she can add Esther two. Yeah it'd be amended. Yep so 
I, I would recommend making it a singular motion because it's a singular action item on the board agenda. So I would suggest the items identified along with S or 2. You want a separate one for S or 2 and a separate for S or 3? No, I would say one motion where it states items 13, 16, 19, and 23 and S or 2 as the motion. Does that make sense, Brian? Does that... Because then it's a singular motion equating to a singular action item on the, on the published agenda. I don't want us to violate any yep. tenants. So I, so I amend my original motion to approve this, uh, all of the SR2 funding as laid out, line items 3 through 10. And then in the SR3 funding, uh, line item 13, 16, 19, and 23. So what happens to on two when we have uh, we approve apparently line five, and we're not including lines uh, um, seventeen or fourteen? You're just approving it for one year, or? Well, yeah. It, if you know, those are the ones I had a question about, Kelly. I mean, I don't know enough about this stuff to to absolutely. But I, you know, all I want to do is I want those oh, SR2. kids to get uh, to get the attention. I think we could have two motions, three motions. We're acting on it, just so the motion is positive. And approval. Those four, and then we come back and act on S or two separate motions. So going back and then amending my original original motion, we would just focus on the ESSER three fundings of 13, 16, 19, and 23 first. Second it. Was seconded. I think we're at a place where we can just call the question. Amend it. We're voting on the amendment, right? I have SR3, 13, 16. Approve SR3, line items 13. I'll put the FTEs, 16, mental health, 19, success interventionists, and 23, school psychologists. And do you feel comfortable that the public that's watching this wouldn't understand what those numbers are or should repeat it? We, we have the chair repeat them. Somebody repeat them what they are. I'll go ahead and repeat them. So item... On the list of ESSER 3 potential expense items, 13, district social worker, which will provide school-based social work and extension of current position in the district. Item 16, district mental health counselor, 2.0 FTE, school-based mental health counselors. Item 19, well, excuse me, I should state that that is for uh, three years equates to and I'm going to say approximately $435,816. The item 19, District Student Success Interventionist, 8.0 FTE, interventionist allocated in an equitable manner across the buildings to provide intervention supports targeting students who may need additional academic support, equating to approximately $1.6 million. And item 23, District School Psychologist 1.0 FT conduct primary functions related to serving school psychologist needs of assessment, reporting, communicating, etc. That is equated to over the duration of the ESSER 3 plan, $262,000. So those are the items, those are the, the related anticipated or projected expenditures. And I, I think we should have just a roll call vote because the by voting here, this is not what the what the motion reads. So, I think Brian could have a roll call a roll call vote. I can do that. I'm also rewording it. It'll be a totally. It'll be a motion to approve the following S or three items, and I'll <coughs> list them out specifically. It's 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 up to you, but that's the motion will say what we've talked about. It won't say a total S or three. I defer to you and the chair. I would just let the electronic roll because we're three votes in. Yeah. It will say what Dr. Willard mentioned, those we'll trust only that. those four items. 
And, and the board also has a chance to look at the board minutes at the next meeting to make sure they're put in there right and make any changes. I will not make any errors, but just you to could, review. You could send that to the chair and she can make sure it's right. I mean, there you go. So we I don't do have to wait a month. To... Good idea, Wes. All right. That motion passes. I don't have another action item, though, for SR2 discussion. I would it would would um, uh, would be a motion for S2 approval of item three, four, six, seven, uh, nine be appropriate. Clint, and we want you to keep. And ten. We want to keep, want the meal, wheel, wheels to move. So. And ten. And ten. Yeah. And ten, right? Ten. And ten, the nurses. Yeah, yeah, yeah ten. Five, yeah. isn't yeah. it? I second it. All but five and eight. Five and eight are out. So everything in ESSER 2 except five and eight. So that would include the BHS one-to-one -one lease, district social worker. It would not include the student group at this point. It would include staff bonus paid in 2021, the technology of student devices. It would not include the staff training or development, and it would include curriculum support and increased school nurse hours. So is that what you've created in here, Brian? <laughs> Let's take a roll call vote. Do I need to move us forward to? I see new motion number one. 14 yet though. Oh, Brian, you need your mic. I'm gonna, I will propose, but I will send the wording to you, Miss Melissa, just to make sure. But I have ESSER 2 all except 5 and 8. And it was Wes made the motion, Van second, And I have it written down as well as on the computer. Um, if that's OK, I'll just click Submit. And we'll see what I have. That, yeah. Is it showing up? Yes. All right. Quick type this in here. All right, so the vote right now is on SR2, just the items we called up. Motion passes. I would suggest Laura doesn't do a nice job on this. I assume she did this that you figure out some way to graphically demonstrate what we've approved and what's, what's, what remains on the, on the action items. And add some more colors. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have gone as far as we can go for tonight. Then my next question is for the rest of the items that are outstanding, do we need to address those prior to Friday? Are we, where are we at for a timeline for the rest of the items? It'd be up to Dr. Willard, but I think we could advance these forward and do a supplement or amendment later. But is that? Does our proposal need to account for the full amount the, but, uh, but on the 20th or? Brian, maybe you can, I think what we have to say is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, as I understand it, we would simply state that to be determined and we would alloc uh, we would identify those items accordingly. Just they'd be held as set aside. It was just just a set aside. Yeah. I think Van had a had a nice uh, ten dollar word that he used earlier tonight when he said, um, "I'm trying to remember what it was." I had to look it up quick. Um, basically, it's held in escrow until it's utilized. Yeah, it was. <laughs> but we we wouldn't want to drag that out, so we would want it at one of the soonest opportunities we could. I would correct. envision so that we know what our, in, again, I think so our, our community knows what our hopes are. Um, and again, knowing that we can be fluid. I think it's really important that n understanding our plan will, will change and adapt and we will have to amend it. I think it is really important that we are very clear with our intentions and what the plan is and we don't just leave an ambiguous 
to be determined hanging out there, which just doesn't feel transparent with our thoughts. So for me, I just want to make sure that the community knows what our intent is, that our district knows, um, all understanding that we may have to change, check and adjust. Yeah, I, I can't I can't agree with you more. And I think it helps with the uh, thought that Kelly had, and that is that uh, I think this will allow us, if we try hard, to be more intentional and have better communication about what our what our needs and pressures are and what we're going to do going forward. I mean, it's it's up to us to um, make the case. Okay, sadly, we find ourselves at one of our last items. We need a motion uh, to remove from table the 2021-2022 classified handbook. I so move. Second. Oh, go ahead. Move by Deb, second by Van. It's going quicker now. They see the adjournment in sight. Um, any discussion? Oh, wait. No, sorry. I just need to move us forward. Do we vote to remove? Okay, we'll call the question, please. Thank you. Okay, motion passes. It is off the table, and we are now ready for a motion of approval of the 2021-2022 classified handbook. I so move. Second. Moved by Deb, second by Wes. Any, or sorry, Van, I apologize. <laughs> Any other discussion? <laughs> Um, we did put a little um, information there, but we'll we'll look at adding a cell phone policy later. And our training suggestion, we do a training for all staff to cover um, harassment, et cetera, items like that. And um, a mandatory reporting that's covered in the training as well. And so I, I think we have it covered this year with the exception of the cell phone policy, but we will encourage staff not to use, um, abuse the cell phones. Right, any you. other questions on that? All right, we'll call the question. Motion passes. We need a motion for adjournment, friends. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa moves, Wes seconds. <laughs> Call the question. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight and hanging in there with us till 9 p.m. We appreciate it. Hey, Paul, did you see? weren't here when I actually voted in favor of your handbook this year. Did you see? <laughs>